Welcome everyone to Aaron 48 day one. We're so glad you're here with us today. I still see people rolling in, but we're gonna go ahead and get started with just a few housekeeping items to uh, get us going. Can I have the next slide, please? Uh, we thank our board of trustees for all the important work that they do for uh, us and all of our community. And we know that many of them are here today. So we, uh, we are thankful that they're here and glad to see you. Next. We also have huge thanks out for our advisory council. Um, this advisory council of ours is working hard to get these policies uh, through. And we are thankful to them and the many of them that are here today as well. We also have our NRO number council here today, and uh, you'll be hearing from one of them this afternoon. And we're super thankful that they are here as well. Next slide, please. So I just wanna briefly talk about how to be successful getting around the Aaron 48 platform. Um, and while I know that you've probably been to 437,000 Zoom meetings or meetings of some sort virtually in the last, uh, a uh, few years. Uh, let's talk about how to be successful today. Go ahead. So we all know where the chat function is. It's at the bottom of your screen and has a little speech bubble by it. Please note that our chat is for our general conversation. It's for um, the opportunity to ask questions of each other. It's a chance to um, cheer people on and everything else, but it is, it is meant for our general conversation and we like to try and keep it on topic. Go ahead. Notoriously, Zoom likes to, sorry, if you can back up. The, notoriously, Zoom likes to default to an all panelist situation where it um, notifies the hosts and the panelists of your awesome comments, but forgets to let everybody else know. So make sure you've dropped that box down and made sure it says everyone instead. Go ahead. We like to keep our chat professional on topic and following the Aaron standards of behavior. We appreciate your help with that today. Next. The question and answers box. What I'll tell you right now is that when you have a thought or a question for a presenter today, feel free to put that into um, the Q&A box um, right when you think of it. We ask that you add your name and affiliation and uh, we will, the moderators at the time will present that back uh, to the group at appropriate times. So you're feel free to put them in and we will hold them in queue until it's time. Next. You can also raise your hand. We love to hear from you, even if we're not in person. So when you raise your hand, it'll turn green for you just so that you know. And uh, that will also put you in queue to speak just as if it was an open microphone. And then we'll let you know when it's your turn and make it so that you can unmute yourself. Next. Uh, I'm sorry, again, it will just let you know that it'll turn green. That's how you'll know your hand is up. You can lower your hand by clicking it again. Just a couple rules and reminders for you. Um, our board of trustees chair, Mr. Paul Anderson will moderate discussion of the draft policies so that all can be heard during this time. We really appreciate that anytime you are on the microphone that you clearly state your name and affiliation each time you're recognized to speak. Um, I'm also gonna ask that you probably speak slower than I have been because I notoriously speaks too, speak too fast and, we and our transcriptionist would truly appreciate that. Again, when you're filling in your name um, in Q, I'm sorry, filling in your question in Q&A, if you could take a minute and make sure that your affiliation is there as well, we would greatly appreciate it. If your name is in, you do not have to include your name, but including your affiliation so that we can read that out with the question helps us. Standards of behavior can be found on the Aaron website. Today we have uh, lots of people with us, um, some joining immediately and some other was, uh, and as of a few minutes before the meeting started, we had 13 registered from Canada, 134 in the United States, five in the Caribbean and 17 from outside the Aaron region. So we thank you all for being here today. We are recording and live streaming this, and we have the slides available in PDF form for today's um, event. They are all at the Aaron 48 materials page. Just a note, when you type in that um, URL, it comes, it does require that uh, Aaron 48 is capitalized. I, I believe it defaults otherwise, but that's the, the easiest way to get there. A uh, live transcription is there as well. 
I just wanted to let you know that that uh, registration site that you use to get here is way more than just a registration site this time. With this meeting being spread out and across, across different things and us having a great new platform to use, um, there's lots of resources there that you may find useful during this meeting. Feel free to check that out. The big blue bar across the top of the registration site will get you to all of the different places, including the event hub, which gets you to each of the day's Zoom links if you ever can't find um, your access to that link that day. You just go to Aaron.net slash Aaron48 and you can get to that. Welcome. We, we had to welcome our newcomers last week and we were super uh, thankful to all who attended. Um, and as a result of that, we uh, did a drawing. And um, unfortunately, you have to be present to win. And the person we drew did not show up this morning. And so we had to draw another name. And um, I'm going to feel horrible because I'm probably going to um, struggle over her last name. But she is one of our fellows. So Mary um mary b and i'm not even going to try because i'm afraid i will hurt your last name but i just wanted to let you know that you are our newcomer orientation winner also one of our Aaron fellows this this uh, round so congratulations mary i also want to say thank you to our network sponsors usi is providing our network um assistance and thank you to lumen for providing the backup all right, let's talk about our agenda today. Um, on docket today, we have, uh, we will, right after me, we will have uh, Leif Sawyer discussing our AC docket report. Then we'll talk about policy implementation and experience, routing security, software, and then we'll move to a break. And after the break, we'll have our policy block. Today, we're going to be talking about three policies. Uh, and then after those three policies, uh, we will have some presentations from grant recipients from the last year, a training and outreach update, and open microphone. And with that, I get to stop talking and turn it over to Mr. Leif Sawyer and say welcome and uh, introduce you to uh, talk about what's on the AC docket this year. Great. Thank you. Good morning. Make sure that's everybody hear me fine. Yes. Okay, well then I, I'll start off with the next slide. Yeah, thank you. Good morning. I'm Leif Sawyer. I'm the chair of the advisory council and uh, we're a 15 member body. Everybody on the screen right now is an important member of the community, um, all helping to shepherd the policies that the community um, brings forward to us and um, considers important enough uh, that we work on um, so we can address the concerns uh, for how Aaron manages its uh, 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 its resources. Next slide, please. So we've had um, a number of uh, activities happen since Aaron 47. We've sent uh, three policies up on the screen toward the Board of Trustees for adoption. Um, I'm not gonna read all of these here for you, but all of these were adopted and implemented in the last revision of the NERPM in August. Next slide. And we've also sent these two policies to the board and they are working on uh, implementing them currently and we'll have that out for the next NERPM rev revision. Um, just a reminder for everybody who uh, may not know, you can look at past revisions of the NERPM online at Aaron and we can probably find a URL and put it in chat for you. Um, we have a GitHub uh, Git repository so you can see all of the history of changes in there as well. Next slide. So since Aaron 47, um, four have ad advanced to draft policy, the four listed below. Uh, we've had one policy withdrawn by the author and the two pending uh, Shepherd review, as you should see activity on those very, very quickly, but they will not be uh, discussed here at uh, Aaron 48. Next slide. So one recommended draft policy on the docket, uh, special use case for IPv4 space being out of scope for determining waitlist eligibility. Um, this is a, a pretty strong one. So we're really looking forward to getting some feedback from the community about this policy, this rec recommended policy. Uh, next slide. And the five draft policies here. Um, 
one is fairly new. Uh, that's the 2021-6. 20, that's uh, one of the, the, the uh, ones that have come in very recently. Um, but all of these, obviously, we're uh, very excited to get some community feedback from. Next slide. And that's it for uh, this quick introduction uh, to the docket report. Um, and we'll take any questions if you have any. And just a reminder for those who may be typing a question, and we'll give it just a few seconds, um, that you need to include your affiliation, please. You can also raise your hand if you have questions for LAFE, but I'm sure that the majority of those questions are probably coming later specific to those policies that are coming in. Uh, LAFE, it does not look like there are any questions, so thank you so much. Great. Thank you, and thanks, Sean, for dropping the the URL in chat. And at this time, I'd like to introduce uh, Ms. Lisa Liddell from uh, Aaron to do our policy implementation and experience report. Oh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, um, I, I just um, like to say that the, the policies that we have now, they all seem to be working very well. So this isn't really a, a problem that we want to discuss. It's more of um, just some discussion to make sure that uh, the community believes we're implementing a process uh, correctly. Next slide, please. So we're actually seeking guidance from the community about multiple discrete networks um, as it relates to Section 8.3 and 8.4 transfers. Uh, we've been encountering some organizations that are trying to receive space under the 8.3 transfer specifically, um, and they do operate multiple discrete networks. Their overall organization doesn't really qualify based on the um, utilization requirements outlined in section 8.5.6, uh, but they do have one or two or a few networks individually that would meet these utilization requirements. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so what we've been doing is we kind of look at each of the networks as sort of a standalone entity. Um, we've borrowed the information from Section 4.5 for multiple discrete networks so that each of the networks has to qualify um, based on the items in the number resource policy manual. Um, like I said, Section 4.5 items one through six. So they can't be a consortium. They have to have a compelling criteria. Uh, for creating the networks, um, such as regulatory restrictions. Um, they're geographically distant from one another, um, very diverse, that type of thing. Um, and then we look to see that each network um, meets the utilization requirements and the projection requirements um, in section 8.5.5 and 8.5.6. Um, and that way we can help the organizations get space for the networks that really need it. Um, well, um, they can continue to use their other space for the networks that have just maybe just been turned up. And um, that's really all that we wanted to discuss about this. Thank you so much. Uh, at this time, if anyone has any questions for Lisa, this would be the time to ask them or raise your hand. And we'll give just a minute. All right, Lisa, it looks like we are good for right now. Thank you so much. Thank you. And at this time, we're going to turn it over to Mr. Brad Gorman for a routing security update. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Um, again, my name is Brad Gorman. I'm the senior product owner for routing security here at Aaron. Um, next slide, please. So we're going to go over um, what's new since our last meeting and uh, since Aaron 47. Uh, we're going to talk about the internet routing registry, the non-off shutdown specifically, um, the changes and growth in RPI, excuse me, here at Aaron. Um, talk about some of the new training opportunities and talk about uh, new product development that is underway uh, in the routing security domain. Next slide, please. So since uh, uh, we had our last meeting and, and discussed a shutdown of Aaron's non-authenticated IRR, our object growth has grown. Um, 
uh, can animation, please. Um, so, so we sent out a notification to all of the points of contact that have the ability to make IRR uh, entries or deletions at Aaron, and that went out on June 14th. Uh, we are offering suggestions internally with how we can help um, reduce the number of objects that you have in our non-auth and the non-auth uh, uh, opportunities or, or uh, different places where you can put your objects that are in our non-auth uh, should you choose to do so. Um, it's work uh, under the, the Chief Customer Officers Organization and the Registration Services teams. Uh, one, of, one of our team members, John Worley, uh, there's the routing security at Aaron.net uh, mail alias that comes to me and the remainder of the team. And of course, the Aaron Help Desk uh, can, can uh, give some assistance where needed. Next slide, please. So since Aaron 47, 6,000 new objects have been created. Um, and that's 6,000 out of 60, there are 6,000 out of 62,000 objects. Now, the fact is, is one organization is responsible for 92 and a half percent of those objects. Um, and of the ones created, almost 99% of them are route objects. Now, uh, we've been in communication with that one particular organization, uh, giving them giving them the awareness that what they're creating is showing up in the non-authenticated IRR uh, and certainly offering assistance and, and suggestions on how they can clear them out of there. Uh, but still, that, that leaves 510 objects that have been added uh, to the non-auth area through whatever um, uh, mechanisms that happened that got them put in there. Uh, and we certainly want to work with everybody and start decreasing the number of objects we have. Next slide, please. So March 31st, 2022 is the date we all need to keep an eye on. Uh, we need to prepare for that date when it shuts down. Uh, suggestions would be taking an inventory of your objects. What are in, what's in that non-auth? And what do you want to do with those objects? Do you want to uh, make changes that will put them into Aaron's authenticated IRR? Or do you want to choose a third party location to store your objects? Once you know what you have, what the options are, you need to make a plan to execute, and there's only 163 days to go. So, uh, if you have questions, you want some help, please reach out. Uh, we're here to help, and otherwise, just uh, know that March 31st is coming. And at that point, at that date, if you still have objects in the non-auth database, they will be um, that database is going to be turned down, so they will no longer be available. Next slide, please. So with RPKI, uh, we're going in the right direction, thankfully. Uh, since, since the end of our last meeting, uh, the number of orgs has grown by 20%. Uh, there are currently, uh, that, with that included 364 new orgs selecting the hosted RPKI option, uh, seven new orgs selecting up down, which is delegated RPKI, uh, to a total as of last week to 2,193 Aaron organizations have enabled and are participating in one of the RPKI uh, solutions that we offer. The number of ROAs in this case uh, is a 74% growth, which is, which is astounding. Uh, there have been a great uptick in the number of large and small orgs that are creating uh, route origin authorization uh, uh, um, objects and that these are truly the first step and the, the foundation for how RPKI works. So good job to everybody who's doing it and recommend keep moving forward. Next slide, please. Again, since April, uh, we have had uh, a couple events where we've done uh, webinar training and there's been some new training uh, uh, videos created. Uh, Notably, in the end of August and beginning of September, we had two sessions for how to enhance your routing security with Aaron's hosted RPKI. Uh, those are available to us uh, or you, everyone, uh, on the link following below, where we have uh, our all of our training and webinars linked. Uh, and there are also some easy, short how-to videos uh, that that certainly are helpful, uh, very clear, uh, to, hopefully to you. Uh, and, and 
kind of answer a lot of the questions, a lot of the recurring questions that our, our RSD team addresses. So please take advantage of those, take a look. Uh, the, the videos are very short. The training sessions that we have are certainly more in depth. Uh, the webinars are typically about uh, 60 minutes long, but there's full, a lot of good information, answers a lot of questions, and it maybe it generates a few more. So uh, when, it, when it comes to it, again, that's what we're here to do. We're here to help. And you can reach out to that routing.security at aaron.net email alias, and, and we will get back to you uh, as soon as we can. Thank you. So what, what's coming up that's new? The uh, feature development that we have in place uh, in, in flow right now on our, on our roadmap. There are four uh, of the larger uh, work efforts, development efforts that we have in place. Uh, first one is the development of an RFC 1918 uh, compliant publication service. Uh, colloquial term is hybrid RPKI. Uh, essentially, it's an opportunity for an organization to run their own certificate authority um, and, and maintain a central location for their um, for all of the resources that they have, but using a third party resource, Aaron in this case, to run their publication server. Um, it is that that alone takes a lot of the uh, uh, responsibility and requirements for running your own uh, repository and publication server, the, the uptime requirements and the maintenance and, and uh, general upkeep for having those repositories is viewed as having been one of the sticking points or, or really the hurdles to get over towards deploying uh, your own certificate authority. So hybrid um, uh, will give you the opportunity to run your certificate authority, which is a, a much lower requirement, um, but also uh, offload that repository and reporting server responsibility to Aaron in this case. Uh, one of the next uh, major development efforts we have is uh, we're, we're going to set up automated re-roll of RBKI objects. Now, this is something that has been um, asked for and discussed in the Aaron community and the greater RBKI community. Um, it, it will range from uh, creating default times for your ROAs, uh, doing default rollovers, uh, so that the, the expiry timers, we're, we're, we're hoping to reduce or remove the untimely uh, expiration uh, of your ROAs in, inside of the repository that we run. Uh, and the, the, the intent is so that um, organizations maybe that don't have uh, an active uh, role in creating, deleting on a regular programmatic basis, it will remove the, the um, um, inadvertent loss of your information in the RPKI infrastructure uh, on, on the, in the internet. Um, no, notification times, all, all of this is, is being bundled into this offering. Um, and if you have any more interest in, in learning about this, please reach out. The last two uh, uh, work efforts that we're, we're putting in, uh, we're, we're looking at tighter integration between the two main routing security uh, offerings that, that we have through IRR and RPKI. Um, this could include creation of a, a ROA upon creation of an IRR object or the reverse creation of an IRR object in, in the, the point of, at the point when an organization uh, creates a ROA. Certainly there are, are you know, requirements to this. You know, we're, we are not going to create a ROA if your organization hasn't uh, chosen to, to start implementing RPKI or using those services. But uh, in the, the, the desire in this product is that it will simplify the administration of both of these different services and hopefully reduce the, um, the impact towards, uh, towards you having to maintain it and hoping to make sure that the most up-to-date information uh, is available to you and to the people on the internet that use these products. Uh, the last thing is two-factor authentication. Again, this is something that has been asked for um, a fair amount in the community. We, we've had suggestions that have asked for this. Um, uh, amongst other pieces of it, people are looking for, or organizations are looking for further uh, um, security controls over 
uh, point of contacts that have access to make changes to IRR, to RPKI, to, to billing. Um, and, and we have had some uh, external requests for making it so that the privileged accounts uh, can effectively enforce users before they can get into and make these changes beyond assigning them the proper uh, uh, privilege by, by making them a, a technical POC or a routing POC, things along those lines. So um, it, it, it is something that we are working on in this case. And as the, the features come to be developed, we'll, we'll be reaching out to you and please fill, uh, make, make additional requests into our system um, for any things or features that you would look for Aaron to provide to you or uh, re requests for enhancements or changes and the, the ones that we already have now. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide. Am I still there? <laughs> okay, great. Um, if anybody has any questions, please, uh, I'm here. And at this time, if anyone has any questions for Mr. Gorman, please uh, put them in the Q&A box or uh, raise your hand so we can get you uh, unmuted for the right place. Just give it a second and I'll at the same time thank you uh, for your presentation. And it does not look like there are any questions at the moment. Um, I will... Thank you so much and move on to the next presenter. Thanks, Mr. Gorman. Very and much. our next presenter is Mr. Mark Costers uh, with our software update. Good afternoon, everybody. So this is Mark Costers. Um, hopefully you can see me. Um, and so I am here to talk about uh, a software update. And it's actually a little bit more than a software update. So the, the team works together on essentially everything. So whether it be the developers or uh, the people at systems integration dealing with the testing or the people dealing with operations, making sure everything runs, uh, we all work together as a team. And one of the things I really like, appreciate about doing these presentations is it allows me and others to see how we're doing. And uh, so what I'd like to do is go through uh, our agenda. Next slide, please. So here we're going to talk about statistics, which is always one of the funnest things that I like to bring to the table. And uh, then I'm going to talk about uh, software releases, our operational improvements that we've made, our challenges, what kind of things that we're dealing with that's taking a significant amount of unscheduled time, and also what's next. Next slide, please. Okay, let's go on and talk about statistics. And this is uh, one of the funnest things I have that I like to bring to the table. And that is the number, of, uh, the first thing we're gonna talk about is Aaron Online. And one of the things that continually amazes me is the number of people who set up accounts on Aaron. And you can see here that we're on track for doing another 15,000 accounts uh, this year, which is pretty uh, spectacular given our, our community and the people who have to uh, deal with us. That's a lot of accounts that go into Aaron Online, and and uh, the system is obviously very easy uh, can handle this very easily. Next slide, please. Here you have Aaron Online uh, online logins over a period of time, and again, what's interesting here is there's approximately thirty thousand plus people who have logged into uh, Aaron Online at least sixteen times, if not more. And some of the numbers that are obviously out, uh, automated are out, uh, just astounding on the number of uh, logins that come in. So anyways, uh, what's interesting here is that you have a lot of people that log in once and say, okay, that was kind of interesting. I don't know if I need this again. I have a few people that log in a few times, um, maybe to make sure that their uh, account's linked to their POC or something like that. But there's a lot of people that use Aaron online uh, managing on a day-to-day -day basis. Next slide, please. 
Here's an interesting slide, and, and this is our provisioning transactions, and we have two ways of actually going about it. Uh, first one is uh, using architecture called templates, which have been around since the early 90s. Um, and these uh, templates have been around forever, and um, Aaron has been moving away from them um, as much as we could by giving uh, opportunities to do either use a RESTful API service that we call RESTful here, uh, or we, you can actually use Aaron Online's web interface to, to input information. And you can see here that over time, that templates have sort of uh, slowed down. In, in fact, looking at this number, the graph really doesn't do enough justice to it. Um, there's a policy change made a couple of years ago requiring that, um, that uh, POCs be validated, uh, points of contacts be uh, validated before they're put in for either reassignments or reallocations. And what this meant is that um, there's a lot of internet service providers at that time said, hey, you know, this is a great time for us to actually modernize our infrastructure when we report information to Aaron. Let's move from issuing uh, templates via email. Let's go ahead and use the RESTful interface. And um, you can see there here at the red line, the RESTful interface line has grown by quite a bit more than templates have. Uh, so there's a lot of people that have uh, followed this. Uh, it's starting a flat line, which I expect to see on templates, and it's getting to be less and less every month. Next slide, please. Here is who is and who, who is RWS. Who is is the pink line, and that's the tra traditional port 43 service. And you can see here that we've had a pretty significant dip in traffic. And I'm going to talk about this and the challenges. Um, but you can see that we were having quite a bit of growth. And um, it, during that time of growth, we would prune people from time, our organizations or bad actors from time to time on, on, on seeing sort of abusive traffic. We have all kinds of, of, of criteria we put in place in terms of tar pitting that I've talked about in previous NANOG or Aaron meetings. I believe I also talked about it at a NANOG meeting um, where we actually put in some sort of form of rate limiting. And we use that to safeguard our infrastructure from people um, reading something and saying, hey, I can use AWS to actually create all these instances and, and get all basically a directory of Aaron's inventory here uh, if I keep on um, doing who is requests. Um, there's also a RESTful who is uh, RWS service that we put in as a predecessor to RDAP, which is coming in the next slide. But you can see that when the uh, traffic went down with who is, the traffic went up with who is RWS. And what's interesting here is some of those people that we uh, detected as abusers on using port 43 actually pivoted and went to um, who is RWS. Next slide, please. And here's our RDAP traffic. And you can see here that we have essential growth. Um, it's not a huge amount of growth. And again, that there was a vector here where things uh, decreased quite a bit because we, uh, uh, again, part of the challenges that we're going to talk about, we found uh, some people that were doing things that was kind of surprising to us. Um, and and we, we will talk about that a little bit more in the future. But you can see overall that RDAP traffic is increasing. This is an internet, internet uh, protocol st uh, standard that's being promoted by the ITF as a replacement to who is um, off of port 43. And this is something that not only are the reg regional registries a part of, but also uh, registrars and registries in the domain industry are also following the standard going forward. Next slide, please. So now let's pivot and let's talk about the software releases that Aaron's put out since the last Aaron meeting. Next slide, please. So here we have had the uh, releases uh, since Aaron 47. One of the things that we had is that we had a, much like RIPE, we had a brute force uh, a password attack, and which basically at that point in time created a lot of locked accounts. Um, so we had, at that time, we had a system in place where after a number of uh, attempts, we would actually lock the accounts out. Um, we had a request come in. Uh, saying, hey, we really need to follow uh, uh, the NIST standards and other standards if relevant, um, and actually follow their standards going forward in terms of dealing with login throttling and password guidance implementations and so on. 
So we followed the NIST SP 800-63B standard um, that has very specific guidance on what login throttling should be, as well as password uh, uh, guideline implementations to make things fairly complex. Accordingly, we also added a password generator. So not only do you have a password generator that's part of your web browser, perhaps, but you could also use the one that's found in Aaron. And um, actually what's interesting here is there's a lot of people that actually use this password generator. Uh, we also have some new fees that are coming out and we put up some uh, uh, um, a system that actually shows uh, per um, org what the account changes, uh, what the uh, implications of this uh, new uh, uh, fee schedule will be like. So that's another thing we put out. When, the next thing that we put out that Brad's talking about, a lot of the things that Brad has brought up are things that I'm bringing up because we work together quite closely. Uh, we have a number of new IRR RESTful commands that we put out, list of routes, list of route sets, list of AS sets, et cetera. Um, and we also are now adding in RPSL uh, inclusion with IRR objects and we'll have more to come. Um, We've also upgraded DNSX zone generation for reverse zones as part of our uh, system in terms of uh, tech debt. We had some old libraries that we removed um, that are no longer in support and have been in support for a decade. Uh, so we've been moving forward with that. We have our premier uh, support plan PSP rollout that um, we're doing in line with the CCO office. And we have a quite a bit of reduction of technical debt that we put it um, forward. And the big he thing here is actually the conversion of some of the Java libraries that we have underneath our corridor system, uh, moving from seam to spring within the, within the Aaron online applications. Again, um, seam hasn't been used, hasn't been improved for, for a long period of time. Shortly, it will no longer be supported in up upcoming versions of Java. So this is something that we need to move away from and move to spring. Next slide, please. And so now let's talk about some of the operational improvements that we put out within Aaron. Next slide, please. So here you can see that we've done a lot of things um, that many of them are transparent to you all, which I think is great um, because this means that we did our job. So the first thing that we did is um, uh, regarding DNSSEC. Uh, we sign reverse zones uh, in adder.arpa and ip6.arpa, and we, we upgraded first of all the, the DNSSEC signer boxes that we use. We use what's called a bump in the middle uh, technology where zoned up updates are made, DNS updates are made, they are sent to this one box that actually then signs it and then sends it out to uh, basically what's called a, a, a master and that hidden master then sends it out to the uh, secondary services you see out on the internet. And uh, this system was woefully behind on updates. Uh, we had asked our vendor a long time ago to put in some custom code based on some uh, unique uh, keys that we created. It, um, at that point in time, we were frozen in terms of um, updates uh, because they weren't supporting our, our fix that we asked them to put in at that point in time, the very uh, initial point in time where we started DNSSEC. For a number of years, uh, they finally put in our fix, uh, which was actually very nice of them. We were up, able to upgrade our signer boxes. And at that point, we moved from a old algorithm, algorithm five within the DNSSEC parlance to algorithm eight transparently. And this moves us to a much stronger set of, of uh, security algorithms that the community uh, now recommends. Algorithm five is soon to be deprecated, not yet, but it's on its way. Uh, next thing that we've done is to sort of enhance RPKI. We added a new RRDP repository Delta protocol instance, um, and we put that in the cloud. And now instead of three instances of RRDP service, you will now see four. Three of them are run at Aaron and within our three data centers, and the fourth is run in the cloud. So that is a new system that we put out. Again, it's transparent to you, but it allows for better and more diversification for this important service that Brad is heading up. Uh, we've had a lot of uh, end-of-life EOL box replacements that we've done. 
uh, Aaron's uh, systems are quite significant. Uh, we have lots of boxes that we uh, end a life uh, that have served its purpose five years, if not more. And uh, so it's time for their replacement. Um, we also have uh, moved our production NetApp boxes, our file servers that are used behind our, our various boxes that we use to help provide services to y'all. They all have been moved to Dell and Overt. Um, so we used a, a virtualization technology moving from Red Hat's virtualization technology to the sort of public domain equivalent, which is called Overt. So we have one NetApp that's um, in Red Hat virtualization environment that's still left, um, and that serves our internal systems. Uh, it's a Mongo huge uh, box, um, and it turns out that we just didn't have enough time to get it done this year, and we hope to do it next year. Next slide, please. So now what I'd like to do is talk about some of the challenges that we have. So Aaron is quite diligent on updating its, its technology. We're quite diligent on adding new features. Uh, but uh, what I'd like to do is share with you, uh, at, uh, and all those things are scheduled, right? Uh, we have an estimate of how long these things take and what needs to be done. But then we have these uh, bumps that come up. And as I mentioned very early at the very beginning, we, we work as a team, uh, whether you're in operations or development or, or within uh, the uh, systems integration team, we all work together when there's a, a challenge in that under, uh, underway. So we, we, for example, what I like to talk about is uh, directory services. This is something that um, is quite high volume. Um, it's something that's fairly unique. Um, between the regional registries. We all do the same things here. Um, our system seems, I don't know why, but we get a tremendous number of queries, um, basically two or three times what the highest uh, number two does in terms of number of queries per second that comes that serve through our infrastructure. Um, over time, that we actually realized that we needed to create some safeguards. So we put in this tarp pitting service that I had talked about in previous uh, Aaron meetings how we safeguarded our who is infrastructure. Basically what we do is we have a, a, a limit and say that limit is um, five queries a second, or maybe it's 10, let's just say 10. And you have 10 queries per second as your limit. And you come in at 11 queries per second. That one query that's above the 10 queries per second actually gets sort of quarantined and put on the side. And the next time, at the next second, you come at nine. That one query that was put in the quarantine is then added to the mix and, and, given, and uh, coming back with an answer. So, and if you kept on with that threshold of 11 uh, queries per second, and that one is uh, quarantined, and then another 11 and another is quarantined, then over time that sort of uh, it, it peels off and in, in atrophies in, on that particular query that's been quarantine actually dies off. So that way we have a, a sustained rate that you can actually have, but yet we're safeguarding our systems when you have anything over that sustained rate, um, we're actually going to um, a drop. Um, and this allows people to do some traffic and then realize, okay, I need to back off here a little bit and um, allows those questions to come back. So we do occasionally have periodic high loads. And when those things happen, we call in a team whether it be ops, dev, QA, or we call it uh, systems integration or SI internally. And at that point, we look at, okay, what's really going on with the system here? We review the logs and the code, and we spend a significant amount of time on each event. Some of the events are, okay, this turns out to be a slow query. It's like a um, being on a mountain road and you're behind a large truck which in this case is a very expensive query, and you have lots of cars behind it. You can actually have a higher throughput if you had lots of cars and not a big truck going up the hill. But since you have this big truck, it basically creates a backup. And we've had those sorts of things before, and we eradicate those uh, large queries the best we can as we go forward. Some of those queries are still just frankly more expensive than others. So, um, as I said, we spend a, a significant amount of time calling through logs, trying to figure out, okay, is this a query issue? Is this a configuration issue? Is this a, a uh, database performance issue? What, what's the issue? Um, and I, I, what I'm gonna do now is sort of move on to a, 
uh, a most recent example, where we had a, evidence of a very large botnet. It had thousands, hundreds of thousands of unique IPs coming across from disparate regions of the world. And these queries would come in and we would have a couple coming from one IP address and then it would go away. It wouldn't come back. Then we would have a different one. And we, it, we were looking at this and what was interesting and how we can identify it is we saw it, we detected a very unique signature associated with this botnet. And at that point, we called in the FBI and we contacted various ISPs from the source IPs that we saw. And um, the FBI in particular was very interested in this because this was an emerging botnet that they had not heard about and, and they wanted to know more. And one of the ISPs actually came back and said, hey, it's this other service over here that uh, allows you to add some free software to, to your mix, but in return, they are able to use your machine as sort of a conduit for people to do third-party sort of queries. And it turns out that there's a number of legitimate uh, organizations that were using that, including the FBI. And uh, so when we were going through this, we talked to this uh, company that is actually providing this proxy service. And uh, we found out through them that there was a couple of threat intelligence companies that were generating a large part of this traffic that we at first thought was a botnet. And we had talked, we talked to them uh, with some of their developers on, uh, virtually uh, over Zoom. And we found out what they were doing and how we can actually uh, give them some improvements so that they wouldn't actually uh, hit our system so hard. And they were very thankful for that and went ahead and actually uh, went to a new way of actually you know, getting that information. So anyways, uh, that took a tremendous amount of time. And you say, well, hey, that shouldn't have been so bad. But when you're in the sort of uh, uh, the, the heat of the battle, a lot of things are not quite as clear as they are when you exit the battle. And when you are in those battles, you have to actually deal with it and you figure out what the problem is and you move on. But it does take a significant amount of time. Uh, next thing that we had that was quite abusive is who was reports. We have a lot of people that uh, actually create, uh, ask us for these reports. And uh, there's two ways of doing about it, going about it. And these, these uh, requests are made. And what's interesting is that these adversaries actually do their best at trying to figure out what their limits are and how can they actually get close to the limit and not break it or find other interesting ways of trying to get around uh, the, the limits that we put into the system. And uh, again, we actually have to look at this, try to figure out what the issues are, uh, detect the actual issues uh, and challenges, and actually, uh, in this case, talk to RSD, uh, the Registration Services Department, in terms of contacting the customers and saying, hey, what are you doing? And maybe you need to stop this. <laughs> so that was another case that we have. And the last one, of course, is brute force attacks. Uh, we still see them. We see them on a weekly occurrence. And if there's any um, actionable items, we actually give it to RSD for them to actually do follow-ups. So these are things that are things that are unscheduled that we actually have to look at and follow through on. Next slide, please. So let's talk about what's next. What is uh, engineering doing as we go forward? Next slide, please. So uh, again, we work on we're working on fee harmonization. Uh, so we have this new fee schedule that's coming out. Uh, it's a, quite a bit of work for us. Um, we're finding out that uh, that fees actually touch good part of Aaron's engineering uh, uh, operations. Uh, not only does it affect the, the billing systems that um, are used by third parties, but we have tight integration with those billing systems within Aaron Online. And you can see that when you uh, actually display invoice through Aaron Online, uh, that is actually a result of that tight integration. Uh, maintenance uh, uh, reminders and those sort of things also come through Aaron Online. And again, those things are just again, just tightly uh, tied with our third-party uh, vendor that we use for um, uh, our accounting system. Um, we also have some secure routing announcements. Uh, Brad was quite good in bringing up uh, uh, things that are going on with uh, Aaron in terms of improvements, adding RPSL with an Aaron online, and adding the publication service, as well as multiple other things that Brad actually talked about. 
Uh, those are things that we're uh, adding on right now. Uh, we have uh, a lot of technical debt that we're still uh, challenged with. Uh, we are continuing to replace libraries that are end of life. Uh, we have a significant amount of end of life activities uh, as uh, still underway. Uh, again, most of this, if not all of it, will be transparent to you, but it's very apparent to us. Uh, we run um, audits, uh, uh, automated audits against our systems to make sure that there's no security vulnerabilities that are known by the community uh, through these the libraries to make sure that we're covered. And we do that on a weekly basis uh, just to ensure that we're, we're in a good security posture. Uh, we're, we also are looking at uh, fixing any issues that may come out of our current security audit that will be complete by the end of the year. This is something that we do every every year. Um, and if there's any challenge, any issues that do come out of that re, uh, report, we actually fix them right away. Um, we're also enhancing our operations to comply with new insurance and security certification requirements. Uh, as you may know, we uh, hired a, a vice president of uh, security and inf uh, information security, and we're going to be following and actually doing some security certifications for 2022. And there will be some resultant work within engineering operations to uh, make that happen. We have some PBX improvements we're going to make. Um, I think some of you know uh, that our, uh, from time to time, our telephone service has gone out. Uh, the uh, RSD help desk has not been available. Um, if you look at our availability, you'll see that, hey, this is one thing that Aaron is actually not 100% on is our, 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 our help desk phones are, have been down. Um, when we moved offices, we moved, uh, we kept the same uh, PRI vendor uh, and we're using POTS lines right now uh, as we went forward. And when, we, when they groomed the circuits to make this happen, it turns out that um, the vendor we're using actually has two levels of subcontractors underneath them. And so whenever there's an issue, it's typically with the very slow, lowest level, um, that's the physical provider um, that actually has an issue. And it just takes time for them to actually get this stuff worked out. So we're actually going to go to a, a voice over IP solution, which should eradicate this issue. Um, we also have some public face, uh, facing services PFS site improvements. And um, our systems are starting to show its age. A lot of the systems there are at least five years old now. Um, and we're re-engineering a, a more efficient way of providing services like Whois and RDP and RSync and all these other services that Aaron provides. So uh, next slide, please. So at that point, I am done. And if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer. Thanks, Mark. It looks like we do have a question from Donnie Lewis with the Obsidian Group. Is the security audit available to the group? Uh, yes, that's a really good question. And uh, the, the answer is uh, basically no. <laughs> and the reason why the answer is no is this is a, a we, um, as the security audit actually comes out, we are very, um, we work very quickly and diligently to fix any issues. But what we don't wanna do is, is to compromise Aaron's security by saying, hey, these are the issues that Aaron has. So um, the answer, that short answer to that is no, it, it's not uh, a part of it. And maybe uh, Mr. Kern, I see you're online right now. If you wanna add anything further. I am Mark, thank you. Um, I just wanted to say uh, it's a valid question because clearly people want to know, not just that we have a security audit, but that, we actually uh, uh, don't have any security compromise risks remaining open. We uh, actually have, as someone might have noted, we uh, we noted earlier, we just brought in a VP of Information Security, and uh, that's the first step in working towards an actual accreditation framework uh, for security uh, availability, reliability. So uh, we will not be providing our our security audit. I, I don't feel like giving a roadmap. Uh, but we will be moving towards a, a certification and accreditation framework in that area. So thanks. Thank you, John. Um, and, any other questions? Donnie Lewis had a follow-up question. Is there a summary or will a summary be available? Uh, 
Not at this point in time. Um, just to be assured, uh, one of the things that uh, Mr. Kern mentioned, and I'll sort of reiterate this, is we're going to be going through a number of security um, uh, certifications pr uh, processes this coming year, which uh, involves a number of audits as well. And part of that is um, some of these things will become more transparent in terms of us um, asserting some sort of security practices uh, that I think will people will feel much more comfortable and in, in terms of Aaron's security posture. So, um, and we, to that end, we hired this uh, a vice president of information security to actually sort of, uh, to spearhead this effort. And I, I think you'll see some um, very good transparency based on that. Thank you, Mark. We have another question from Robert Seastrom with Capital One. As you may be aware, multiple VOIP vendors have been subject to attack in recent weeks. Yes. Perhaps it would be good to consider adding phones to the HTTPS Aaron.statuspage.io dashboard so that if there is a problem, it's apparent to those who pay close attention. And it actually is. Um, it, the, those, those phones are actually on the, the status page. Uh, I believe it's under help desk, if I'm not mistaken, or something close to that. Um, so you can see that, and there's, uh, I believe there, there's announcements for those who do subscribe to see that when we do have uh, outages that they, they would actually um, be shown to those who are interested. Good question, though. Very good question, RS. Thank you. All right, I do not see any other questions. All right. So I will uh, thank you, Mr. Costers. We uh, appreciate all that information. That was a lot to uh, digest over here. I appreciate it. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, very quickly, before we go to the break, I'd actually like to bring Mr. Gorman back. We had a question that came in for uh, his session that actually came in after we had moved on to the next session. And I just wanted to make sure that got read into the record. So one of our fellows, um, uh, and I'm sorry, it's a Siobhan, Dev I think it's Devonish, uh, asked if we were only focusing on uh, two-factor authentication for premium accounts, or did he hear that wrong? Uh, no, no um, we're, we're not focusing exclusively on either, when you say premium accounts, I'm going to differentiate whether it's either premium orgs or, or premium support customers, um, or just the privileged accounts on an org. Uh, the two-factor authentication is being developed so that uh, an organization can uh, blanket put the two-factor authentication requirement on anyone who is linked to an org. Uh, and then there will be additional features to the privileged uh, POCs. The admin, for example, uh, will be able to have controls over um, uh, the, the additional accesses that people may have. Even even beyond just what that POC, whether they're a tech POC or, or a, a, a routing POC, um, that hopefully that answers your question. Perfect, thank you so much for coming back to us. We appreciate okay. that. Okay. We definitely wanna get questions answered. So at that point, I'll tell everyone to stick around during the break. Next slide, we uh, will have a five minute quick break so everybody can, um, step away if they need to, and then our famous stretch with Aaron will be uh, broadcast for about 10 minutes of a seated stretch that can get everybody moving because we all know we're sitting in these chairs for way too long. And then we've got our word scramble game today. So I will be hosting a word scramble game with a prize at the end, so you never know. We will be back with our policy block at 1.30. So uh thank you so much and i will we'll move on to our break see you all back at 1 30.
Welcome to our first stretch break. Hope you're looking forward to working out some of the kinks from sitting at your computer. I'll be guiding us through about 10 minutes of seated stretching. Um, a lot of these stretches you could do on the floor or standing up if you wish, but in order to make this accessible for everybody, I'll be seated the entire time. So let's go ahead and take a moment to get comfortable wherever you are. Finding a nice tall spine as you sit either on the ground or in your chair. And just allowing yourself to connect with your breath for just a moment, slowing down. You can close your eyes if you wish. And if you'd like, you can place your hands on your belly and really start to lengthen those breaths, breathing in through the nose and feel the belly expand as you breathe in. Nice and slow. And exhaling through the mouth. Feel that belly soften back into the body. And taking your time. We'll do this a couple more rounds, breathing in through the nose. Really pulling that breath down all the way into the base of your spine as you feel that belly expand with air and exhaling. One more time, breathing in. And exhaling. If your eyes were closed, you can open them now. Placing our hands on our knees or just above them, we're gonna to start to do some shoulder shrugs. 
So allow your shoulders to go up, back, and down. And you can start off really slow, feeling the motion of these shoulders moving, creating some space through the chest as you pull the shoulder blades together in the back, releasing some of the tension in your neck as well, and breathing through every movement we do here. Allowing that breath to work its magic on any knots or tension you may be experiencing. And if you wanna reverse that direction, that might feel good, opening a little bit of space in between the shoulder blades as you push them forward. And then resetting back to neutral. We're gonna drop our head over to the right side. So very slowly with a straight spine, allow that right ear to fall towards the right shoulder. You're going to feel lengthening along this left side of the neck. If you'd like to add a little bit more of um, a stretch here, you can place one hand on the top of your head, just gently pulling that ear down closer to the shoulder. And you can hold on to that opposite shoulder to create some more traction here. You can also drop that hand down to your side. Taking a deep breath in, maintaining a straight spine. And exhale, returning to neutral. Allow it to just sit for a second, noticing the difference between one side and the other. This side probably feels a lot longer now. Taking a deep breath in as you exhale, begin to drop that opposite ear down towards the shoulder, feeling a wonderful stretch. And again, you can add a little bit more of an intense stretch here by just gently pulling the head and the shoulder in opposite directions. But again, only if that feels good for you. Listening to the body. And on an inhale, returning back to neutral. We're gonna interlace our fingers and place them at the base of our neck. We're gonna open up our elbows nice and wide, creating a little bit of an arch in the back. You'll see I'm kind of creating a C-shape with my back here, just subtle C-shape. Open those elbows out, gazing up slightly. You're gonna be creating space in your chest through your heart, opening up those shoulders, also stretching the spine. As we exhale, we're gonna start rounding the back, bringing those, those elbows together. Dropping that head, coming into a C shape with the body on the front. And inhaling as we open back up, arching the back, cradling that head as you gaze slightly up. And exhale, rounding, bringing those elbows together. And slowly returning back through neutral, dropping those arms. We're gonna twist over to our right side. So bring that left hand to the right knee and start twisting, placing that opposite hand behind you, maintaining an open chest and heart as you start to twist that spine, gazing behind you, holding onto that knee for support. And take a deep breath here, as deep as you can with this twist. And exhale into center and moving over to the opposite side. You can also hold on to the back of the chair or the arm of the chair, depending on where you are. And of course, if you're on the floor, holding onto the floor for support. And exhale, coming back through neutral. We're gonna take our right leg now, and place it up on your left thigh. You're gonna to wanna to flex that foot. That means the toes are pointing back. So they're not just relaxed, but they're actually active. And this is gonna engage the muscles here. And this can be stopping point one. This is just a really nice stretch for that inner thigh muscle. If you'd like, you can deepen this a little bit just by tilting forward over that leg. As you tilt forward, you're gonna notice an even deeper stretch here. So listening to your body, kind of finding your stopping point where you're feeling a stretch, feeling some release, but not feeling any pain or pinching. Of course, breathing through this as well, using the breath to release and coming back up through center, bringing that foot back down to the floor, preparing for that opposite side, bring that left foot onto the right side. 
Again, stopping point one here, you can add a little bit of pressure to that knee if it feels good as you release the inner thigh. And if you'd like to take this a little bit further, if you wanna get a deeper stretch into this and your body feels like it can go there, start tilting forward from the hips, bending over that knee. And slowly come back up to neutral and relaxing that foot back down. We're gonna drop our right hand down, right? Just let it hanging next to us. As we inhale the left arm up and over, and we're gonna start to open that side body. So grounding down through those feet for support. You don't wanna start caving in on yourself here. You really wanna maintain openness through the body. Openness through the heart and feeling a nice stretch along this side. Inhaling back through center, drop the arm. And we'll inhale that right arm up as we drop the left arm down and open up the side body on the opposite side. You can also tuck your chin kind of into your armpit area and gaze up if that feels good. Or just keep your head straight forward. Feeling a nice deep stretch of the side body that doesn't get a lot of love throughout the day. Might feel tight. Inhaling back up through center. We're gonna bring both arms up overhead, interlace the fingers and flip the palms and just stretch those arms right up. Really creating length through those arms, through the torso, stretching the spine. And relax the arms down. And from here, we're just gonna close. Just taking a couple of deep breaths. Again, you may close your eyes. Just resetting the body, feeling a moment of relaxation. We'll swoop those arms back up to the sky, really nice big stretch, bringing the hands down to center. Thank you so much for joining me for our day one of our stretch session. I hope you look forward to playing games after this and we'll see you back at the meeting. All right, I am all stretched out and ready to go. And I want to know in chat who's ready to play word scramble with me. So let me know in chat, make a, make a comment if you're ready and I'll explain the rules for it. Oh, I see a bunch of people ready to scramble. I see people who even spelled scramble funny. Uh-huh, he's got jokes today. All right, so word scramble with Aaron. This one's a really easy game. I am going to um, show a word in scrambled form on the screen give a little bit of time so people can try and jump in on uh, chat to let us know what you think the actual word is. And then at the end of the uh, presentation, or I'm sorry, at the end of the game, I will draw a name. I will pick a name at random. I'll actually have our other host uh, pick a number as I will have noted who in chat has been participating and those people will have an opportunity to uh, win a $25 gift card to your choice of uh, Grubhub or DoorDash or Uber Eats, I believe are the three choices that you can choose from. Uh, remember to change your setting in chat to thank you, Amanda, to everyone rather than just hosts and panelists, because we all want to cheat off each other's answers. No, okay. All right. Are you ready? First word. Here we go. There's the mixed up word. What do we think it is? Type it in in chat. Oh, Mr. Huberman thinks it's Caribbean. Got lots of things. Let's see. All right. Are they correct? They are. 
Good job. This is a participation, not necessarily win, but you do get the pride if you manage to be the first one to put it in fast. All right, here's our next one. See if you can beat him. Ooh, it's a long one. I see one answer. Oh, it looks like everybody was trying to get in there. Tom beat the rest of you in. You are right, it is infrastructure. Boy, these long ones, I don't know how you guys do that because long scrambles mess me up. Um, I can do a lot of things, but word scrambles mess with my head. All right, here we go, number three. Wow. I'm sorry, Leif, it only counts if you get the whole word in. <laughs> Lots of people, ship fellows, you're absolutely right. How did you know? We have several ship fellows here at Erin 48 and we're so thankful that you're all here with us today. They have been learning for um, three weeks about Erin um, and successfully participating in meetings. And they even have an additional um, one after this one. All right, let's see, we got another one. It's a shorter one, can you figure it out? It's not ship fellow. Oh, Kate seems to have gotten into the mix. It's not fellowship. <laughs> it is customer. Good job, Kate. Way to sneak in there. You got in before some others. All right, you ready for the next one? Here we go. Do, 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 do. Feel like I should have background music. Hmm. Ding, ding, ding. Good job. Does it work for priorities too? Nope, almost. You're missing some eyes. I was like, uh oh, so close. Amanda says, so close. Yes, it was repository. All right, good job, guys. Uh, next one, here you go. It's the octagonal. Whoop, whoop. Way to go, guys. Technology or mology. You are absolutely right. I don't know about you, but when you're trying to race on a game like this, I always find myself typing too fast. And I bet there are lots of you that are having to fix your typing because when I'm trying to hurry like this, it never seems to come out right. All right, try this one. Do, 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 do. Up, oh, Mr. Huberman is back in the in the uh, the race, and there are lots of networks. You are absolutely right. All right, Leif, I need more coffee too. That's a whole story. Let's try this one. There's all your eyes. Hmm. Mm. Ba, 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 ba. Yay! Distribution is correct. <laughs> All right, here's another one for you. What could this be? It's not nouns slippy. Now I'm going to slippy. 
just going to try and say this over and over again. Nope, there's no Z. It's not normalize. Oh, I love a good stumper. What do we got here? Any suggestions? Is everybody stuck? <laughs> it's where we're headed. That's a tough one, but this was where we're headed on November 4th. All right, that was a tough one. Let's try a different one. Congrats, Amanda, on throwing the curveball. Pete wants you all to know he couldn't have spelled Minneapolis if you wanted him to, but you can spell committee. Good job, guys. All right, couple more. Try this one. Just had lots of discussion about it. It is security. You are absolutely right. I've got a couple more for you and then we will draw for a prize. Mm. It's not Minneapolis. That was a tough one. Good job, Mr. Provost. Provost, Provost. I apologize if I if I mispronounced your name. All right. We got a couple more left. How about this one? Stiffnerosaur. It's a dinosaur. Way to go, Miss Jerry. She got it first. Transfers. Nice job. How about the it was till? That's right, everybody. It's the wait list, a topic of discussion in one of our policies coming up. How about this one? I think this is either my last one or my second to last. I can't remember. That's right. <laughs> Disco would be more fun, but it is discussion. Um, and we are thankful for the discussion and hope that there's lots of discussion regarding the policies uh, coming up in the next block. Oh, come on. This one I got pretty quickly and I don't do it really well. <laughs> there you go. This one's just hard to retype. Autonomous for the win or mountainous. Wow, that works. Man, nice. I love it when someone finds another alternative. It just makes me happy. I lied, there were a couple more. <laughs> Registry is correct. Thank you to all playing. All right, that was my last one. Let's pick a winner. The winner gets a $25 uh, gift card to DoorDash, Grubhub, or Uber Eats, which means somebody's going to bring you food. Melissa Goodwin, are you here? I am. Okay, we had an awesome participation. I don't know if you were watching any of this, we, but it was pretty we, amazing. We sure did. I loved um, seeing those fast fingers typing in those answers. Right. I don't know about you, but I always end up flubbing up words when I'm trying to type that fast. 
Yeah, um, I was confused on some of them. <laughs> yeah. But did you get Minneapolis? <clears throat> I did. You did? Oh, well, you would know. I, yeah, yeah, as the meeting planner, I have a little uh, expertise with that one. So she's been, she's been spending a lot of time studying the word Minneapolis. So, yes. um, Melissa, we had over 25 people participating. Can you pick a number between one and 27, please? Sure. I'm going to pick number 12. Okay. Give me just a second. Well, I'm glad I asked for the, the correct pronunciation of his name because it's Tom Prevost. Whoop, Tom, whoop. congratulations. And uh, we will be in touch to give you your gift card. And thanks everybody for playing with us. We're going to give you just a few minutes and then we will um, we will get started with the meeting again in about two or three minutes. Thanks everybody for playing. Welcome back to the second half of uh, Aaron 48's day one. At this time, we are entering into our policy block, and I want to introduce Paul Anderson, the chair of our board of trustees, to take us forward. Thank you, Beverly, and uh, hello, everyone. So this will be uh, an opportunity for anyone who is uh, on the Zoom uh, to participate in the policy process which develops the policies which staff use when um, dealing with number resource requests. So this is an open process. Please feel free to comment and question uh, and give your feedback. Uh, normally at this point, I'd hold up a book that we give in person that would give you a great flow chart um, and an explanation for the policy process if you're new to it, uh, but we'll put it in chat for those that are, are newer. Um, so we are gonna discuss three policies this break. The first one, uh, Aaron 2020-6, allowance for IPv4 allocation swap transactions by 8.3 specified transfers and 8.4 into RRI transfers. As we do with every policy, we have the advisory council will pick one of its members uh, who's been shepherding the policy to come up and present and give you all a bit of background on where we are. And that person to start us off will be Rob Seastrom. Rob, hopefully you will now appear magically. Uh, there we are, and you'll take it away. Thank you, Paul. Uh, this is um, draft policy Aaron 2020-6 allowance for IPv4 allocation swap transactions via 8.3 specified transfers and 8.4 inter RIR transfers. Uh, my co-shepherd on this is Amy Potter. Next slide, please. So how did we get here? 
Uh, the proposal came in uh, at the end of May 2020. It has been uh, accepted as a draft policy, gotten staff and legal review, and it has been pre presented at two conferences, uh, two public policy meetings. It was last revised on uh, August 26th, 2021. Next slide, please. So the short executive summary of what we're trying to do here is to allow organizations to swap out a larger block that they currently have for a smaller one. And the idea here is that if they transferred out the larger block and got another block from somewhere else that any deaggregation had already been done, uh, the, the damage was already done. We wouldn't be adding bloat to the internet routing table by uh, breaking up a block unnecessarily. Next slide, please. So the formal problem statement is organizations wishing to swap out a larger block for a smaller one in the interest of avoiding deaggregation as opposed to breaking up their existing block and transferring only part of it are forbidden by existing 8.3 policy from being the source of the transfer for their larger block after receiving a smaller one for 12 months after receiving the smaller block. In practice, Aaron staff has been allowing orgs to transfer out blocks after receiving smaller ones inside of the 12 month window but many Aaron resource holders are not aware of this. Some resource holders have worked around the restriction by creating a new org to receive the smaller block, but this practice has impl implications on waitlist policy as the new org is now technically eligible to apply for waitlist space while the original org cannot. Similar language is present in NERPM section 8.4. As such, the practice should be sanctioned for these types of transfers as well. Next slide, please. So the policy statement is uh, shortened to the point. It says clarify the conditions under 8.3 and 8.4 that explicitly allows transfer of larger block in exchange for a smaller one as part of a renumbering plan by making the following changes in 8.3, 8.4, and 8.5. Next slide, please. So side by side, we have the current uh, text on the left and the thing that we are going to add or change on the right, and there's going to be a succession of these. Uh, the current text on the left, I'll save the time and not read that aloud because it's there in the NRPM for anyone who wishes to read it. Uh, for the first change, the proposal is to add section 8551, transfer for the purpose of renumbering organizations with larger direct allocations or assignments then they require may receive transfer of a smaller block for the purpose of renumbering onto the smaller block if they transfer the entire larger block to a qualified recipient under section eight within one year of receipt of transfer of the smaller block. If the larger block is not transferred within one year of receipt of the smaller block, then the smaller block will be ineligible for transfer under sections 8.3 and 8.4 and the organization will be ineligible to receive any further transfers under this policy. Next slide, please. Second change to 8.5.5 is to add section 85511, smaller block size. Organizations may qualify to receive transfer of a smaller block by providing documentation to Aaron, which details the use of at least 50% of the smaller block size within 24 months. Current use of the larger block may be used to satisfy this criteria. An officer of the organization shall attest to the documentation provided to Aaron. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Second policy statement change um, in 856, add section 8561, transfer for the purpose of renumbering. Organizations receiving transfer of a smaller block under section 8551 may deduct the larger block they are transferring to a qualified recipient when calculating their efficient utilization of previous blocks under section 856. Next slide, please. Third policy, state, policy change is to add in both sections 8.3 and 8.4 under conditions of source of transfer, add the following. This requirement may be waived by Aaron for transfers made in connection with a renumbering exercise designed to more efficiently utilize number resources under section 8551. Next slide, please. So, we got a bunch of community reactions on PPML. 
and these are quoted pretty much verbatim, uh, some editing for, for brevity, uh, but uh, one of the reactions was, if I'm reading this correctly, the prohibition on transferring the smaller block kicks in if the larger block isn't transferred within a year. If we considered the option of having that restriction kick in immediately. Another is I've noticed that the officer attestation language is present in the new 85511 subsection. Will this remain in place despite the separate reaction, separate discussion on removing the need for officer attestations if that passes? Next slide. Another reaction was I think the larger block should be allowed to be sold in pieces, notwithstanding the dis disaggregation. Another reaction was I think the recipient should lose the ability to receive addresses immediately upon receipt of the smaller block until the larger block is completely sold, including waitlist addresses, not included other reserved addresses. And the last reaction was if the smaller block is a slash 24, there should be no needs test. Next slide, please. So we'd like to hear from you. What do you think? Is it good the way it's written? Is it something that you completely oppose? Would you favor one or more of the changes of the, that were suggested on PPML or perhaps something entirely different? Next slide, please. Thank you, uh, Robs. Uh, actually, we go back a slide. It's more interesting to have that reminder there. Um, so if we were in person, of course, the microphones would be opening and you'd all be running down the aisles to get there. But this is the first policy, just a bit of a reminder of how we have found this works pretty well. You have two options, which is the Q&A. So you can type your question, we'll read it out. My only reminder as I see the first one pop in, and I thank to Mike for that, um, is please make sure you put your affiliation of your company as part of the question. And if you do forget, just ask another question and put your affiliation in because we do want that for the record. You also have the option to uh, raise your hand and we will open your microphone and you will be able to uh, speak here and you can ask a question of myself, of Rob, of staff, uh, or just make a statement. What is very useful, especially for a policy that's been kind of circulating now for a couple of meetings is, while any, any of the input that Rob's asked for, but please don't feel shy just saying, I support or I'm against the, the concept that the uh, AC is trying to solve so that they can know whether or not it makes sense for them to keep proceeding or whether they have to make a change or if they should abandon it. So uh, please try and give that feedback. Um, and also with, with that, uh, we see the first question from Mike Burns of IP Trading who would ask staff, I think, do we know how often Aaron is providing the exception? I do not know that. We have not asked that as part of the policy development process. We can, we can send that as a question yeah. to staff. I don't know if John Sweeting has a off the cuff response. Or John, John or Lisa, uh, yeah. are you able to uh, speak to that? Yeah, could you repeat the question? They want to know how, how often is Aaron providing the exception that uh, this exception right now? Um, I'm not, is Lisa on? Yeah, I think we're gonna, I think we're gonna need a minute to dig into that. Okay, so, let's, uh, come, let, back. let's we come back. Let's work on that and come back. Now, I would be happy to come back if I had other questions, but this is what I'm going to encourage again, that it's good to give feedback, even if you just say, I'm in favor or I'm against. So if you uh, we have, have a... Have a up if you would like me to um, make that available. Yes. Could you please? Because I just realized I wasn't on the right screen, so I wasn't seeing that. Absolutely so no problem. I'm happy to read them in as well. Um, okay. Mr. Woodfield, you should be able to unmute yourself at this point. Hello, uh, I'm Chris Woodfield with Twitter. Um, I'm speaking as one of the co-authors of the original proposal um, to, to answer Mike's question, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, this proposal was a product of the AC's Policy Experience Port work, Report Working Group. Um, this issue was raised in a policy experience report, which um, which it was the impetus for, uh, for writing up this proposal. Uh, the language has evolved quite a bit since, since it was originally uh, submitted, um, and I support. I, but I still support as written. Um, I do like the proposal that the the prohibition on further transfers be immediate as opposed to one year. Um, I think that is a good idea that would enhance the policy, given that an organization 
doing this sort of transfer is in fact representing that the amount of space that they're transferring in is going to be sufficient for their needs. Uh, there may there may be some wisdom in allowing for exceptions similarly to other places where we have language about um, unforeseen circumstances that an organization can represent. Um, but um, if I were to suggest any of the proposed changes, I would I would suggest that one. But that doesn't mean that. But I still uh, I'm, I still would support it as it's written. That is just an enhancement. OK, supportive as written. Thank you. Um, I see we have John Sweeting now. Yeah, it, it's been about a dozen times. Around okay, 12 a dozen times. times. 10 to 12 times. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Uh, I see Mike Burns again saying I support the general idea, but if it's infrequent, then I wouldn't clutter the NRPM. We get this request maybe a few times per year. Okay. Um, thank you, Mike. Other comments, questions? I assume Chris is not. Okay. I see we have some in favors against, so uh, I'll leave it to Beverly to hit those ones sure uh donnie lewis from the obsidian group uh, uh in favor is written and uh marlon martinez from aws in favor is written okay thanks for that feedback we'll give it another 30 seconds or so um to put in comments and then we'll close the virtual mics if we're not seeing a, a rush to the hand up or virtual mic uh so please um type now if you do have a long thing that you need to type if you could just even just put a qa saying typing so that we and then start your next one so that we at least know to not move on without you so let's go on to the next one and then we'll close the uh the mics after that if there's no further feedback sure joe provo from google aaron ac speaking for myself i support in principle uh support the idea of immediate rather than delayed prohibition thank you joe and um Joe Pace, do you think you could just quickly give us your affiliation so we can put that on the record? Joe okay. Pace, in favor is written. I'm sorry, I don't know. Oh, a uh, member of the American Honda Motor Company. Thanks for that, Joe. Appreciate it. Um, Mike Burns has a question. Uh, isn't the small block restricted from a sale? Mike Burns of IP Trading is uh, has a question. Isn't the small block restricted from sale per year anyway, Mr. Rob Seastrom? Uh, I believe it is. Um, but the issue here that this is uh, this is addressing is confusion. And it does not hurt to note that in line in the policy, although you, you may find it redundant. The policy experience report had a lot to do with uh, um, customers being, uh, members being confused. Just a reminder that I know that while there's the odd discussion occurring in chat, that's, we pretend that almost as if that didn't happen. So please, if you do have comments or questions, the only way to get it on the record so that it can be information provided to the AC is either raise your hand or put it in the, uh, the chat. Uh, so we're going to hope we, we will delay closing because we seem to be getting a little bit of uh, activity here. So let's go to our next uh, comment. Louis Lee, NRONC, ASO, AC, Google Fiber, support as written, support immediate restriction for transferring uh, in additional uh, addresses. All right, uh, we've come to the end of the time allotted for this block. Uh, so I'll give the last call for questions or raising of hands. I know there's a little delay on the video cast, so we'll give it about 20 seconds here and then we will close off. Seeing none, we will now close the uh, mics. We thank Rob for his presentation and uh, we will move on to our next proposal. Thank you very much, Rob. We've I'll give you a little virtual applause right now. Thank you. Uh, and we're going to move on to uh, Carrie Richards. So Carrie's going to be presenting a uh, recommended draft policy, Aaron 2021-2, a uh, special use of IPv4 space out of scope for purposes of determining wait list eligibility. So just as a reminder for those new, the last one was a draft policy. So that is still in an earlier stage of the policy process. Um, you will see it again if it continues to advance. Um, because it will need to come as a recommended draft policy is this one as a recommended draft policy this is uh one of one of not your last but one of your la uh, last opportunities 
to give feedback. So um, I'll turn over to Carrie to give us a presentation of the proposal, and then we will have a discussion, and we will be having a poll. So please go ahead, Carrie. Thank you, Paul. Um, okay, so we have quite a long um, title for uh, Aaron Policy 2021-2, um, and Paul just gave a wonderful um, uh, preview of that. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> so this proposal came onto the docket on the 16th of February this year. Um, it was uh, accepted as a draft policy the following month. And um, my co-shepherd, Matthew Wilder, uh, presented it uh, in my place in, um, at Aaron 47. In August of this year, it received staff and legal review. Uh, next slide, please. So the problem statement. The problem statement is one of clarity. So it says current policy does not clearly indicate whether special use addresses for critical infrastructure defined under section 4.1, sorry, 4.4, as well as special use addressing for facilitating IPv6 deployment definition in 4.10 should be considered as part of the slash 20 equivalent IPv4 space in aggregate, um, which would make an organization ineligible for the Aaron waitlist um, defined under section 4.1.8 of the NERPM. So this is really a question of, or, or a statement, um, a problem of clarity um, and ensuring that we aren't leaving out. Um, uh, so the right people are making it to the wait list um, or being eligible for the wait list. Next slide, please. So the policy statement. So the policy as it exists now, just read it. And um, the author is suggesting that we replace it with organizations which hold more than a slash 20 equivalent of IPv4 space in aggregate, which is exclusive of special use space received under section 4.4 or 4.10 are not eligible to apply. So that's the policy statement that we would like to, um, that we're, we're, we're working with now. Um, and on the left-hand side, Yes, left. Um, <clears throat> we have the statement as it exists now. Uh, next slide, please. So um, based on staff and legal feedback, um, this draft policy revises section 4.1.8 to explicitly exclude space issued under sections 4.4 and 4.10 from consideration when we the total aggregate holdings of an organization applying for space from Aaron's IPv4 waitlist. Now, I, rather than highlighting, I'm, I'm not really um, the one to, to, to do all the fancy dancy stuff. I think um, underlining it makes it much clearer. Um, so the suggested text is clear and understandable based on what staff and uh, the feedback from staff and legal. Uh, next slide, please. So community uh, support so far um, at Aaron 47, we recorded community support for this policy. It was the first airing. Um, on PPML, there were five contributors that made a statement in support of the draft. Um, most of them were plus ones. Um, uh, next slide, please. So um, uh, it, for the previous policy, we had Mike Burns as a, a poser of questions. Um, and now he appears here um, uh, in a quote, anything that makes the NERPM easier to understand is a winner, which is true. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and this is another step towards removing ambiguity in the policy applied to determining the waitlist eligible, eligibility. Next slide. So any questions? So uh, any questions, please start queuing up again. I'm sorry for moving Danik, but I know that we have new people. So at, uh, at this stage, it's a recommended draft policy. What will happen here is we're gonna have a discussion. Uh, I'd ask you to again, name and affiliation and specifically if you're in favor or against the policy as it's written. Um, the, um, we'll do that for a bit. If there will then be a poll, which all of you are eligible to participate in and we'll get to that one in a bit. 
And then it'll go back to the AC where they'll make a determination and then they'll have the opportunity to send it to last call, which is a discussion on the mailing list. And then after that, it can be sent to the board at which point it would become policy. So this is really your best interactive last time to potentially, sorry, last time to, uh, to talk about this policy. So hopefully my preamble, we have somebody has raised their hand or would like to, um, or there's some Q&A. Okay, I see some Q&A popping in. This is my computer decides to freak out. Uh, all right, Beverly, let's go on that one. Uh, Gary Geeson, eGate Communications, Aaron AC, support this policy as written. Thank you, Gary. I won't joke that I can actually see Gary from where I'm sitting, which is kind of amusing. Um, next, please. Donnie Lewis, Obsidian Group, favor, uh, in favor as written. Thank you, Donnie. Also, uh, Gus Reese, Kojic Communications, support the policy as written. And the next one. Rob Seastrom, Aaron AC, Clue Trust and Capital One, proposal author, support is written. And there, just keep coming. Mike Burns, and IP Mike trading support. Yep, Burns support is written. So I see lots of support as written. Would anyone like to raise their hand and speak against this or give reasons why we should not? Not that I, if John Sweeting has raised his hand. I don't think for that purpose, but and Paul, yeah, it's not to speak against it. It's just I just want to clarify to everybody that that is that that's the the purpose of this is to clarify what is actually staff practice today. We are yes. we exclude those special um, reserve pools from evaluations for the wait list today. I just wanted to point that out. I don't understand, that, and it's good to get it codified. Uh, and just but we're just making sure we have support. Um, we have Chris Woodfield. Of Twitter has support is written. So I'll give it a little more, give another 30 seconds to let the video catch up and ask if somebody would like to raise their hand or uh, give any discussion. And then if not, we will go to our poll. Okay, a few questions coming in here. Uh, Donnie Lewis from the uh, signing group asked, what is the actual wait time, Carrie? I don't know if John Sweeting wants to answer. Yes, I prefer John to answer. Thanks. John Sweeting, can you address the question from Donnie Lewis? What is the actual wait time? Um, what is the actual wait time currently for the wait list? Uh, for the last four to five quarters, we have um, been fulfilling every wait list request up to that uh, period. So it's, it's, it's right now it's at 90 days. Okay, and that's just because that's when the cycle actually runs. The most is ninety. It could be a lot less than ninety days. Oh, John Kern has magically appeared. Okay, that means that there's a play uh, on the field here. Just to note, and and this is the same disclaimer you see when you're investing: past performance is not an indicator of future performance. While we have been basically successfully draining the waitlist requests, almost all of them every quarter. It is not at all assured that that will be the case going forward. That's I believe it. some of the, the sources, yes, you know, may not occur, continue to occur. So, yeah. We do continually get address space back, but the crumbs are getting smaller and smaller. Um, next comment, please. And then we are, I think we'll take one more comment. And then if you have not uh, got your name in by the end of these, oh, actually, let's go to Donnie Lewis. Are there uh, John's staff to staff again? Donnie Lewis of the obsidian group. Are there surges? Are sorry, are there surges? I'm not yeah, sure. So Paul, I think he's asking is if there's a, is there a surges where it's been pretty steady actually. We we get we we get um, a pretty steady amount of waitlist requests uh, each week, each month through the quarter. Um, it's been somewhere around uh, between 200 and 250 organizations that have been filled each quarter. But as John Curran has has um, put out there. There's no telling how long that will go. The, the crumbs are, are definitely uh, getting smaller and smaller, and, and this could not, this might not be the case for, for much longer. Before it's going to run out, really. Uh, Donnie Lewis, uh, can you let us know if you are in favor or against based on the, us addressing your questions? Uh, appreciate for the record. Um, let's take our next two comments. Three, com uh, three comments, actually. Go for it, Beverly. Uh, 
Joe Pace, American Honda Motor Company, support as written. David Farmer, University of Minnesota, support as written. Uh, would parentheses or commas be grammatically more correct or more uh, consistent, consistent with NERPM style? We can certainly take a request for uh, a grammar check, which would always be something the AC can make minor edits without doing another cycle. And our let's take this as our last one, since uh, I think we've given everyone ample opportunity to get in. And Donnie Lewis, Obsidian Group, uh, in favor as written. Okay. Thank you, Donnie, for putting that in. Carrie, any last comments before we go to our poll? Uh, no last comments here. Okay. Um, I do notice, and I, you know, we, we, and if this was the public meeting, we wouldn't do it. Uh, but there is just this delay with videos. So let's take the slightly late comment from you, Beverly. Apologies. Uh, Gary Burmaster, unaffiliated support is written. Thank you, Gary. Um, okay. So this is actually the uh, only poll uh, that you potentially will have this policy meeting. Uh, there potentially could always be one on a draft policy, but we always, as a recommended draft policy, ask the question. The question that I'm going to ask all of you um, is, are you in favor or against the recommended draft policy, Aaron 2021-2 as written? If you're hearing my voice, you have the opportunity to answer the poll. Um, so please say either in favor or against. If you're having a problem, if you don't see a poll right now, please let us know in chat uh, and we'll... Uh, try and sort you out here, but we'll give everyone a bit of time. Just a note that if you're running on the web version rather than the yes. uh, downloaded version, feel free to, just as uh, Mr. Anderson mentioned, mention in uh, the Q and A. Q, and we Q and A is where we prefer that. Yeah, so if you if you cannot, for whatever reason, we do ask only if you technically can't, please put in the Q and A, whether you're in favor or against. Give it a couple of seconds here. Last call, closing in 10 seconds. Okay, we are going to close it now. I am going to ask you, Beverly, to add one uh, in favor because uh, because one of the yep. members is a panelist. They could not, but they have indicated in chat. Okay, at the close of the poll, there were 94 um, in attendance and uh, 37 voted in favor and zero against. This information will provide the Aaron Advisory Council for their consideration. Uh, thank you very much, Carrie, for your, your presentation. Uh, we're gonna keep roaring on here because this will get us right back on time, I believe. Uh, so we're gonna have our last policy before uh, of the day. Uh, it's Aaron 2021-3. It's private AS number and unique routing policy clarifications. And I believe we have Chris Taskett as always uh, to give a, a lovely presentation. So Chris, if you can magically appear and uh, Carrie, if you could turn off your video and take it away. Thanks, Chris. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm pleased to uh, present this uh, draft policy at this meeting. It's the first time that this policy has uh, uh, been presented at a public policy meeting. The uh, next slide, please. The my sorry, my um, my co shepherd first of all is uh, Joe Pro, who I wanted to make that clear. Um, so this is the history. I'm not going to go over it. It uh, this hasn't been around for a terribly long time. It just started in July, and uh, the AC accepted it uh, as a draft policy, and we basically. Uh, wanted uh, to wait and get both PPML and PPM feedback before deciding uh, whether to take it further, and if so, how. Next slide, please. Um, the uh, the draft policy came uh, from a policy experience report that um, identified a lack of clarity uh, for Aaron customers uh, when it comes to applying for AS numbers. Um, and uh, some of the issues dealt with uh, the extent to which people were aware of, uh, of the need to apply for unique AS numbers, depending on whether they utilize them on the public internet, uh, what, what the whole um, meaning of unique routing policy uh, 
uh, was uh, what type of network plans they had to submit as justification and um, and cases where there is a, a unique need for an AS number outside of utilizing a unique uh, routing policy such as BGP. Next slide, please. Uh, as a result of this, there have been a number of uh, proposed uh, changes to the text by the authors. Uh, to this point, the shepherds have uh, not yet uh, edited the, this text in any way. And this is one of the changes right here. Sites that do not require a unique AS number should use one or more of the AS numbers reserved for private use is being changed to private ASNs should be used only when there is no plan to use them on the public internet. That is uh, uh, one of the proposed changes. Next slide, please. Um, the next change is a unique routing policy. Its policy differs from broad uh, border gateway peers or a multi-home site is changed to a plan to connect their network using a unique routing policy such as BGP or a network requiring routing policies to be deployed, which are unique only to that network. Next slide, please. And finally, uh, the other change being proposed is AS numbers are issued based on current need. An organization should request an AS number only when it is already multi-homed or will be uh, immediately become multi-homed is being changed to AS numbers should be requested when an organization has network plans ready and is either planning to use a unique routing policy with BGP given as an example, or has a unique need for an AS number. Next slide, please. Uh, there's been a bit of discussion on uh, PPML. It ranged as to scope and nature. Um, it pretty much took place in July and everything's been quiet since then. Some of the language focused on uh, tweaking the language to make it clear that BGP is just an example of one protocol. Um, others asked if uh, this policy is the correct approach given how ASNs are used by cloud providers. Others question whether there should be a reference to RFC 6996. And some question the premise that private ASNs should be used only when there's no plan to use them on the public internet. Um, so some of, the, some of the comments did address kind of the issues that led to the policy experience report and others went beyond that and kind of reevaluated the policy more broadly. Next slide, please. So based on that, uh, we have some questions for you to consider. Um, First of all, does the proposed text clarify things sufficiently uh, as identified in the uh, policy experience report? If not, what additional changes are needed? And finally, are there any other comments relating to this policy? So we'd be very interested in your feedback. Thank you. Thank you, Chris, for that. And um, so the, the queues are now open. Uh, we have some quest great questions here that would be great to get feedback on. But as I said earlier, this is a draft policy where the AC's most imperative thing is just getting uh, feedback on whether or not this is something they should continue to pursue. So even just in favors or against um, are useful. Any reasonings helps as well, but uh, that just gives some direction to the shepherds and the AC. So uh, we open it up waiting for a Of course, if at this point of the day, if there's there's no questions, I'm told I have to start singing, and, and you don't don't want that. Just, Chris has heard me sing; it's not pretty. I think you and John Curran should do a duet. Come on! La 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 la. All awesome. right, we'll give it. We'll, we'll leave it open here for a couple seconds. Again, um, while it might seem like silence is golden, it, it's really oh no, no dad jokes. Um, it really is useful just to get in favors or against. It just gives uh, a little bit of a barometer to the to the AC that they can decide because what they will do at the end of this is they will be meeting virtually soon. Uh, normally it would be right after. Uh, and they will need to decide whether to keep moving it forward, abandon, or start it again. All right, my banter has worked. 
Uh, Chris Whitfield from Twitter says, I feel that the term unique routing policy itself can be a bit vague and doesn't by itself always imply the need for a unique ASN versus a private one. A replacement I'd suggest is routing policy that requires a unique ASN. And he'd like to know if anyone shares his opinion. So thank you, Chris Whitfield for that. Chris, let me know, Tacit, let me know if you wanna jump in on any of these. Uh, I guess uh, I'm next. just wondering, uh, yeah, I'm just wondering if that's a bit circular in its reasoning, that's all. I mean, I, I understand where he's coming from, but I wonder if that language that he's proposing isn't a bit circular, perhaps. Chris Whitfield, feel free to uh, raise your hand and we can open your mic and get a little more interactive, which uh, can speed things up. Uh, let's go now to Joe Pace from the American Honda Motor Company. He suggests including a representative example of a unique routing policy requirement with a diagram. Okay, thank you for that feedback. Um, and Chris Woodfield has magically taken me up on my offer. So let's uh, go to Chris Woodfield's uh, mic, please. All right, Chris, you can unmute yourself now. That's an offer I just couldn't refuse, Paul. Um, <laughs> so um, my, my thought here is that if you, you know, uh, uh, having a policy that is unique to your network, uh, doesn't necessarily need mean that you need an ASN that is public because there are there are definitely cases where you could have a unique routing policy and connect with a private ASN or sometimes not even necessarily BGP. Um, I think I think a better a better approach here would be to say to say that these are the conditions under which a public ASN is required, a unique ASN is required, and if and if, if you have a relevant policy that requires that, then you qualify. Um, you know, multi-homing being one of them, but I'm sure that there are others that could be that could be submitted that would that would uh, that would justify that test. Um, so it's not necessarily a set. You know, I'm I'm trying to get get out of the get out of the mindset that we have these explicit set conditions and more of if you have, if you can just show that need through describing your writing policy, then you qualify. And is there any way to provide some guidance? Because at the end of the day, this has to be implementable of how that <laughs> kind of determination would be made by staff. I'm just trying to, uh, I'm not trying to be difficult, Chris. I'm trying to figure out if there's a way we can refine the language. And by the way, I agree with you. Uh, just to make it a bit clearer for implementation purposes. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that you know the the policy could certainly provide examples. Multi-homing being being 90% of the cases and the most common. Um, but I can also like there there are definitely cases where where an organization can submit a can can submit a plan that says okay I'm not necessarily multi-homed but but I am doing blah, whatever blah is. And because I'm doing blah, I require a, a unique ASN. This won't work with a private ASN and give staff the, you know, empower staff to uh, consider consider those cases as well. Uh, I, think, I think, you know, obviously you don't wanna get rid of the multi-hook language because that is the most common example, but I don't think we should close the door to other cases as well that could come up. So would one way of solving this be in, in, in introducing a word like technical? In other words, there's a technical requirement without which it won't work properly? Yeah, actually, that, yeah, that's a good idea. I agree. Okay, look, thanks. Thanks for that. Appreciate it. Thanks, Chris. And I assume we, we can take you as supportive of the problem to be solved. Just some yes. questions about the thing. Thanks, Chris. Okay, um, we have uh, one feedback. So let's go to that, please. All right, we have David Farmer with the University of Minnesota support continued work. Okay, and we then have a comment from Rob Streestrom, who is there in AC, Clue Trust, Capital One. And he notes that to Chris's point, given that with 32 bit ASNs are approximately as scarce as individual IPv4 addresses, I'm in favor of policy with minimal gatekeeping language. If your engineering team thinks that you need an ASN, you probably need an ASN. Not big on pushing the use of private ASNs for the same reason I'm not big on inter-organizational use of the RFC 1918 space. In other words, let's remove all restrictive language whatsoever. Um, so I'll take that Rob as supportive. Um, but again, for those larger comments, please feel free to raise your hand and, and the mic that just gives us a little 
uh, more interactivity. Um, Anthony Del, oh yes, you did, sorry. Um, Anthony Del, sorry, did you have a question there, Chris, on that quick one? No, okay. No, no. Anthony Dela Cru Cruz of Lumen. There are instances like BGPLU where there are many unique ASN and it's often a struggle to get those through approval since prior ones do not appear to be used globally. We also have many times overused and reused all the private ones. This is this that is fun keeping it straight. Uh, thank you, Anthony. I think we'll take that also as supportive. Uh, oh, good, Chris. I thought you were disappearing on me there for a second. Okay, uh, as we have no further questions or raised hands, we'll give it another 30 seconds. Um, then we will uh, move on. Our, our grant programs, uh, our great grant program. Another five seconds. Microphones and cues are closing. And are closed. So, Chris, thank you as always for a great presentation. Thank um, you. The AC will take this input into consideration. This ends our policy block for today, but come back tomorrow for exciting policies such as clarifications to section 83848.56, an update to ISP end user references, and uh, removing the circuit requirements. So, it should be fun. Thank you all for your participation and turn it over to our, our wonderful host. Thank you so much. And at this time, I'd like to introduce Jennifer Bly uh, to discuss our community uh, grant program and introduce the project reports. Sure, thanks, Beverly. Hello, everyone. Today, I'm gonna to tell you a little bit about the Erin Community Grant Program, and then I'm gonna introduce our grant recipients who recently completed their final project reports. And they're very excited to share about how their individual projects went this year. Uh, next slide, please. So the Air and Community Grant Program was launched in 2019, and it's designed to provide operational and research grants that support initiatives that improve the overall internet industry and the internet user environment. So in summary, it enables projects that benefit the internet community in the Erin region. Next slide. So since the program began, Erin has funded 15 projects. To be eligible for a grant, projects must be non-commercial in nature, and they also must broadly benefit the internet community within the Aaron service region. And they must align with Aaron's mission and fit into one or more of the uh, four broad categories that you see here. So internet technical improvements, registry processes and technology improvements, informational outreach on topics such as IPv6 or internet governance, things like that, or research related to Aaron's mission and operations. Next slide, please. In 2021, we received eight applications from a variety of organization types. And in this chart, you can see how applicants self-identified their projects, including the region where the applicant organization is located, the category the project would fall under. And then you can see that we received requests for more than $108,000 with an average request for funding at about 13,500. Next slide, please. This year, we were pleased to award grants to three projects, uh, a $15,000 grant for raising awareness on digital standards for air and service region countries by Diplo US, a $14,975 grant for IBB6 integrated database phase two by Satvic Research, and a $5,000 grant for the virtual school of internet governance phase two by the Foundation for Building Sustainable Communities. So congratulations to our 2021 grant recipients. A virtual round of applause for each of you. These projects are off to a great start and they have an update report due at the end of March and then a final report due in September of 2022. Next slide, please. So now that you've heard all about the program, if you are interested in applying for a grant next year, the call for applications will be issued in the spring of 2022. So stay tuned for that announcement. Uh, the best way for you to be alerted when that opens is to subscribe to Aaron Announce, uh, the mailing list wh where we will post the opening message. And then for details and the application information, you can find that at erin.net slash grants. And we have one more slide. Uh, now what you've all been waiting for, I'm happy to introduce you to the seven individuals who let you know about how their 2020 to 2021 community grant projects went. Uh, including Nalini, Stephen, and Emarie today, 
and then tomorrow we'll hear from Glenn, Glenn and Alfredo, Job, Phil, and Keith. Uh, thanks to each of you for making a positive impact on the internet in the Aaron region, and we're looking forward to hearing what you've accomplished over the past year. So with that, I'll let our first three grant recipients take it away. Or if you have any questions, happy to answer those. First, we would like to welcome Nalini Elkins with IPv6 Security, Applications, and Training for Enterprises. Hi, this is Nalini Elkins. I'm the president of Industry Network Technology Council. And let me start off by thanking Aaron for their, uh, their, ge their generous grant and all the support that they have given. It has been uh, just wonderful. Um, and so let me tell you a little bit about the problems that we have been working on. And we were working on it um, last year as well. And so uh, what the problem is that a lot, uh, maybe most of the brick and mortar enterprises, um, all the folks who have private managed networks, and you know, and that's really most of the federal government, a lot of the state government, um, in the Aaron region, a lot of the financial, basically the backbone, the backbone of our financial and governmental network. Well, you know what? They've not deployed IPv6, and nor do they have any plans to be doing that. And, you know, a lot of them are still like, yeah, good thought, Nalini. Yeah, we're not doing that. So, <laughs> and, and this is a problem. I mean, we can't just be bifurcated uh, like that. And so, so that's what we wanted to do is we know a lot of enterprises. The people on our team um, are enterprises. Um, and so we want to raise the priority of IPv6. But one of the things we wanted to do is, you know, because there's a lot of mythology going on about, well, what you're going to run into this kind of problem, you're going to run into that part kind of problem. And so we thought, well, you know what? Let's get, take a deep dive into what that'll be. Because, you know, once you know a little bit, about what you're going to be up against, you feel a little bit better. At least you know what the problems are going to be. I think what really scares people is unknown problems. So what we what we did was the following: we we gathered a bunch of of uh, enterprises together, and we had a number of conversations with them about application conversion and security. We also gave a number of webinars. And um, we, there's a whole another set we gave uh, in um, collaboration uh, with APNIC. You'll see all these webinars that we did. Um, and as I say, APNIC was kind enough to support us in partnership with uh, the India Internet um, Engineering Society. That's our, that's our Indian partner. And uh, I'm going to say we had nearly about 1,000 attendees from large and small enterprises from uh, globally, globally. Um, and and uh, uh, quite a few of them uh, went to every single webinar in the series. Um, so, so to talk about what the problems might be, um, just in terms of application conversion, we came up with these 10 large problems that people might have. And, and really, a lot of it is going to be uh, uh, doing that transition. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. It's not once you um, are, you know, once you get started, uh, that's when you're going to see it. You know, once you get to the end, um, uh, you know, you're just fine, but it's in between changing all the IP addresses for disaster recovery in your load bounds and so on. And that's where, that's where things um, can be a problem. And this is why I think a lot of enterprises have resisted. And this is what we really wanted to talk about. Maybe take a look at that blog, because I think this is a conversation that does not happen all that often. And people are just like, well, enterprises need to convert. Well, easier said than done. And then when you get into the area of security, I'm going to say that in, in, in our experience, enterprises are even more intimidated about, by this area, mostly because, you know, it's hard enough to understand security in your world today, but you've got all these different areas of security, 
what are you really talking about? Because security is a broad area. What are you really talking about? Are you talking about uh, about my security audit? Are you talking about um, uh, confidentiality and privacy? And, and if there's any implications um, uh, of that, or are you talking about risk analysis? And you know, if you're talking about risk analysis, well, actually, you're changing your entire network. And so, so there's, there's going to be some maybe some potential problems. It's going to take a long, long time uh, for people to switch over. Um, so please help us. We're still, um, you know, we're still collecting data. Uh, and we want to, we'll go on for quite a while, and then we'll, of course, publish our results. Our preliminary results show that, that, that the, the issues that we point out are shared by many uh, enterprises. What's next? We're going to start getting um, organizations talking about deployment, doing case studies. Lots more webinars. We've got a grant from AP NIC, we think. <laughs> we're, we're still in the process of finalizing to go forth for next year. So great, thank you so much for your time and thank you again to Erin uh, for your kind help in um, uh, with the grant. The next presentation is from Stephen Lee with CARBNOG's project to build out internet exchange points in the Caribbean region. Hello, good day, everyone. Um, uh, thank you, good to be here with you today at RN48. Uh, my name is Stephen Lee. I'm the program coordinator at the Caribbean Network Operators Group, uh, CARBNOG. And um, CARBNOG was one of the recipients of the RN Community Grant Program, uh, 2020 to 2021. And so I want to um, just talk to you and, and report back on our project, the build out of internet exchange points in the Caribbean region. Um, CARBNOG has uh, as the name suggests, going somewhere on the slide here. Right, Carbnog, as uh, as the name suggests, is a network operators group, and so we have um, a technical community who is um, engaged in helping to operate the the, the public and service and um, uh, enterprise networks in the Caribbean region. And uh, one of the focuses of Carbnog over the last um, years is the establishment of internet exchange points, so that we can exchange. Uh, internet traffic within countries and within the region without expensive long haul uh, links. Um, this has been ongoing for, for over a decade, but we do have a situation now where some of our ISPs um, have um, slowed down in their, in their um, development, and there are some which are on the table which have not um, been fully developed. And so CARBNOG has uh, stepped in over the last few years to help those ISPs um, uh, be started and become a significant part of internet of the internet um, uh, infrastructure in the in the region. So it's it's intended to um, help IXPs find their rightful place in the internet economy. Um, it's a multi-year, multi-country project. Um, we uh, the Caribbean uh, region has um, quite a few uh, island nations. Um, and um, and in South America, we don't expect all of this to be completed in in a couple of years. So we're our, our scope is um, all of the the countries in the Caribbean region, um, which we would tackle over a number of years. We want to bring together the technical community and stakeholders to uh, see where the issues are and what needs to be done. Uh, we want to give our internet exchange points ex uh, access to expertise to help build IXPs. And we know we have a lot of that inside of our wider community with internet organizations, um, iron included. Um, and um, want to help uh, in areas in which training on IXP development is needed. And um, the practical, most practical parts with it are to in help with the installation, um, design and installation of the internet exchange points which are needed. Um, the in keeping with the the um, the approach we wanted to take with the um, uh, with our project, um, we broke it down into these uh, activities: consultations with um, our internet organizations in the region, discussions within the Carib um, Caribnog community, uh, research to understand the current state of IXPs, training, um, collaboration with training organizations such as the Network Startup Resource Center. And um, there's one internet exchange point which we are actively engaged in uh, currently with their development, and that's the internet exchange in St. Kitts and Nevis. Uh, the outcomes, um, uh, as, as we proceeded through the project this year, um, 
we had three capacity building workshops as part of CARBNOB and or CARPIF, that's the Internet Peering Forum meeting. Um, uh, one project spun out of this, which is the development of an IXP directory, um, and that will help to give um, uh, knowledge or accurate knowledge of the state of IXPs. Um, we saw improved collaboration between the stakeholders and members of the technical community. And um, as I mentioned, our work with the um, St. Kitts and Nevis IXP is, is in progress. Uh, one thing that we did note is that a lot of the activity was slowed down due to the COVID-19 pandemic, which severely restricted uh, travel and generally took people's focus uh, away from the, the actual uh, some of some of these projects, and so we've we've been working around that. Um, and what we do expect is that the projects will continue to flow out into the rest of this year, and and we'll basically keep moving in this direction um, from uh, from this point. So uh, that that is uh, basically where we are. One of the the big things that came out of this is that we have we have a much clearer understanding of where our internet exchange points are currently and we have a roadmap to building them out over the the, um, the next few years so i want to close by um thanking the um thanking aaron and the community grant program for the for the support it has been um an excellent and developmental um, process so far and to find out more um here's our contact information for cabinet thank you Finally today, we will hear from E. Marie Brierley about her IPv6 integrated research. IPv6 integrated research project by E. Marie Brierley and with the collaboration of NIST, are, we attempted to identify leading indicators for IPv6 adoption for enterprises. The first step we needed to take in doing that was to build the foundation and integrate the data. We are integrating data from Aaron and from NIST. From Aaron, we're getting um, the address acquisition data for V6. And from NIST, we are getting all three services that they are that they're tracking as they turn up on V6. That's DNS, email, and web. This is the first time anything like that's been done. So entity matching was our biggest challenge. Um, this is the first attempt. Um, there are no shared keys between those data sets and they use different methods for identity identification. Aaron uses an org ID and org name. NIST uses domains. Um, this was a, a critical effort for data integrity and because V6 adoption for enterprises is relatively uh, low at this point, we were really concerned about uh, being able to uh, capture a sufficient sample size for the follow on statistical analysis. Um, we were hoping it would be easier than it turned out to be. Uh, we have complex results in terms of the heuristic for um, matching those entities, um, and it was highly iterative. So what we ended up with was a hybrid heuristic, which was programmatic with accompanied by uh, manual validation. So the way this evolved, um, I started this project a few years ago while in grad school, and I was manually matching the NIST domains to the Aaron org, org names. Um, it was obviously very resource intensive and not really repeatable. Um, once NIST uh, volunteered to collaborate, then we were able to move forward with making this programmatic. This is, uh, email was our first attempt. We have matched the, uh, NIST domain with the Aaron email contact domain um, that resulted in a very low match count and it was also some pretty interesting um, data, primarily because a lot of the registrars are, are I'm sorry, the uh, members are using uh, generic email uh, services rather than using their organization email for the contact information and obviously anything programmatic is repeatable. Uh, so then we moved on to matching domains. Uh, this is again programmatic. We were then we went on to matching the NIST domain with the Aaron org name. Um, this was um, it really improved our match count. And now we're at the hybrid where we think we've gotten the best set of results, which, which is matching the NIST domain with the Aaron org name plus the email contact and. Um, and there's some tiebreakers involved in that as well. So our results, what we're looking to do is this is just a short sample of 
the uh, NIST domain name that they're tracking, they're tracking is, you know, about a thousand of them. And this is the org ID. So ultimately we wanna capture the org, air and org ID for as many as possible. Um, and that we're getting the address acquisition dates from Aaron, and then we're getting the first seen dates from um, NIST, and that's what they're tracking, DNS, email, and web. So you'll so from this, we will then move into the statistical analysis and build the models. And what you see here in the red is that some of them um, have a first seen service date, uh, turn up date that is uh, prior to the address acquisition date. Um, those, are, those are the ones in red. So we did see a fair number of those. We'll be incorporating BGP data in order to filter out some of those and, and limit those as much as we can. If for those that we cannot uh, identify a reason for it and correct it, then they will be just eliminated from the statistical analysis. Um, we just, uh, leading indicators of enterprise v6 adoptions are adoption is critical to understanding enterprise behavior and adoption then leading to adoption acceleration. Um, we consider this to be in addition to the lagging indicators that we use already, which is traffic. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you so much for those amazing presentations. And thank you, Jennifer, uh, for the information about the upcoming grants as well. We will next move on uh, as soon as our presenter is ready. There we go. We are next moving on to uh, Ms. Hollis Kara the, for our training and outreach report. Take it away whenever you're ready. Wonderful, thanks Beverly. And thank you everybody for hanging with us today. I, I know I'm the only thing standing between you and the open microphone, which is probably what you're waiting around for. So let's just take a brief uh, brief bit of time to talk about what's been happen happening in training and outreach since Aaron 47. Can I have the next slide, please? All right, it's been an adventure. Uh, this 2021 is the gift that does not stop giving. Let's move on. We've had um, what I'm gonna cover off today as some updates on what's happening inside the team, um, big changes with our blog, updates on outreach events, our fellowship program and training, and then a little bit of a look ahead into what we're hoping to accomplish in 2022. Have the next slide. All right. So we did have um, a transition within the team this year. In the summer, Kim Kelly, who was our longstanding communications writer, um, left us to pursue new opportunities and we wish her well in that new pursuit. We were very fortunate to bring on board Ashley Parks, um, who joined us toward the end of the summer, beginning of September. And she is here with us um, through the meeting. This is her first meeting, so be nice to her. Um, she's helping out Jennifer with a lot of our social media and blog coverage. And why is that? That's because Erin Pratt, who we saw at Stretch earlier, is actually out on maternity leave right now. What you were watching was a video um, from her presentation at Air Stretch presentation for Erin 47, but she is at home. Um, happy and healthy with an, a beautiful new baby girl and uh, we're missing her terribly. Um, so we've had lots of big challenges and we've, we're lots of creative solutions. And the big things that Erin was holding out delivery for was, we can go to the next slide, her other baby. Um, we moved Team Erin. Since 2009, we had Team Erin as our site where we hosted our blog and our community calendar and a bunch of other great content. Uh, we started the process kind of toward the beginning of the year, end of last year, to integrate all of that inside of Aaron.net. And we did it, uh, actually just days before Aaron's baby arrived. So it was, uh, they're almost twins. Um, if I have the next slide. So if you go to Aaron.net slash blog, you're gonna find our new blog homepage. Um, all of the content that was at Team Aaron has been moved over with redirects. So your experience should be pretty seamless. Um, we have a subscription option. 
don't rush to sign up yet. Uh, our first vendor is not working out great. So we're gonna be making a switch here, hopefully in the next few weeks. Um, and we'll really start promoting that subscription option once we know we've got that up and working well. Um, as I said, all the blog history is there. We also have a improved community event calendar. All of our community events carried over from the old site as well. So all that history um, has been retained, but the new event calendar is really cool in that you can sort it based on events that are community events, errand events, and then even a, a little bit granular within that space about you know, categories of events. So if you're looking for something specific, it should help you find things a little bit more quickly. Uh, we also moved over our library of IPv6 case studies and our Aaron Bits newsletter library. So it's really cool. Um, we're really happy with how it turned out and we hope you'll go poke around. If you see anything um, that you like, don't like, whatever, please reach out to us. We're always happy to get your feedback and make adjustments where we can. Uh, the other point I wanted to make is we just uh, updated our site search and now blog is actually a category under site search when you're at Aaron.net. So you can actually use the Aaron.net website search to specifically search the blog if you aren't interested in using the category tags that are displayed on the blog homepage. So there are a couple different ways you can find your way around. The next slide. Okay, outreach has been an interesting scene since uh, through the summer and into the start of the fall. We had spun up a really great, Jennifer Bly took the lead on our strategic partnership program. And that was really a way for us to keep engaged with a lot of the organizations where we would typically present in person or host uh, help desks or have presenters because there's carryover between the audiences and their folks that we wanted to do outreach to. Well, when everything kind of locked down, we started moving that more into the webinar space. So we were working directly with a lot of these organizations in the beginning of the year to host webinars, content that they content that was Aaron content, but that they wanted us to bring into the space where their members are comfortable, which was you know in their on their front yards. So we were doing that through a series of webinars. And what we found as we started to hit the summertime is that those organizations were really shifting their focus to back to getting to their in-person events. They really wanted to host their conferences and get people back in the same place. And, and we get that, we want that too. Um, what that meant is we saw a very sharp dip in webinars and we were starting to schedule a lot more in-person events. And then we hit summer and we had all the Delta variant fun and a lot of those things were canceled. And so we're still kind of working through trying to find the best ways to connect with those organizations and their audiences as we're moving forward. Um, we did have one uh, by request live Q&A session for Internet 2 about IPv4 um, legacy resources. And we actually had 156 attendees at that one. So it was a really successful outing and we were really pleased um, with that event. I'm going to have the next slide. All right. Our other big program, which we have carried on, um, started at the end of last year, we've carried it through this year thus far is Aaron Optimized. That is our Aaron Welcome for new customers. Basically at this, we grab everybody who's come in um, for the quarter, we send them an invite and we have a have a one hour, hour and a half uh, webinar to kind of walk them through all the things that are available to them as customers. We've had 74 attendees across the sessions we've held so far this year. And we have a lot of other people who register and choose to watch it afterward because we send that link out to them. So we have one more scheduled for December and then we'll be probably revamping the program a little bit uh, now that we have a year of experience with it, some refinements we wanna make going into 2022. But overall, we've been really happy with the outcome and it's been great and we know it's working because we see folks that have registered and attended that going on and immediately showing up and registering in our on-demand training. So it's, it's a nice on-ramp for folks that are new to the Aaron space. And the next slide. And then event presentations. As I mentioned, we had mostly been doing that inside of the strategic partnership program. We've been trying to ship that more to in-person events as we're able. And we have had some events which have been conducted in person and others where it's been an online only. So even just last week, we were at the Indigenous Connectivity Summit. Uh, John Sweeting gave a presentation there. So we're continuing to look for those opportunities and schedule them out um, into 2022 as we're aware of conferences coming um, 
coming online and, and folks opening up their calls for presentations. The next slide. Okay, just one last quick shout out to our fellows. Uh, our fellowship program has been around since 2009. This year has been our first year fully virtual. We are not yet sure what 2022 will bring, but the one thing that we have learned is that this more structured program has allowed for a much richer, richer and deeper engagement with our fellows and with the mentors to really help our fellows come into the meeting and feel like they can really hit the ground running, which is great and it's exactly what we want. So my assumption is even once we are able to be bringing fellows back to meetings in person, we're still going to retain some of these features that we've added in the virtual program because they've done such a great job of helping our fellows really, really get comfortable and familiar inside the policy development space and uh, familiar with the players in the organization so that they feel comfortable and confident walking into the meeting for the first time and, and taking an active part. Move to the next slide. All right, training. I'm going to recap. Brad mentioned a lot of this earlier in his presentation early this afternoon. We did have two new webinars um, since last meeting. One was on Aaron's RESTful API for IRR, and the other was uh, our first um, our first webinar on RPKI. Both of these are currently available as on demand. Um, so I encourage you, if you or someone you know needs to learn more about either of these services that those are available to you on the Aaron website. In the next slide, we had a crazy month in May. We actually had one, if not two events every week all through May, which was a load of fun now that we're past it, but we ended up serving over 250 live attendees and we've had over 160 on-demand views. So we know that our efforts in this area are working. We are able to reach people and folks are able to get the information they need. And we're gonna to continue to build on that strength as we head into next year. I have the next, yes. And we also have two great new uh, on-demand videos, or not on-demand videos, I'm sorry, just in time trainings. One is on creating your route origin authorizations using Aaron online. That one um, is just a very quick, simple, screenshotted walkthrough to help you understand what you're doing if you're new to creating ROAs. So that's wonderful. And we have a new six minute Aaron 101, everything you need to know about Aaron, which is a really helpful, um, helpful piece for folks that are brand new to the space or coming from a different area and just needing to get bootstrapped in on what Aaron's really all about. And the next slide. All right, as I said, quick look ahead to 2022. Next slide. All right, it's gonna be it's gonna be fun. I'm I'm excited. Um, we're actually bringing back in person uh, Q1. We already have three three events that are we're working on scheduling out. You'll see registration open in January, most likely for all three. We're bringing back Aaron on the road and lunch by the numbers. Um, we're hoping to continue that across the year but we'll be having three of those events in the first quarter. So we're looking forward to getting rid of, getting back to delivering some of this content to folks in person and having those conversations that as much as we try, you can't quite replicate in the virtual space. Um, that said, we will still be growing our online events. Uh, Brad and the team are already hard at work on a RPKI 201, um, which hopefully will debut in the first quarter next year. That's the plan. As I said, we're going to be looking at how to freshen Aaron Optimized as we carry it forward um, for our new customers. And one of the things that's long been on our list, and we actually have had a couple of attendees at events bring it up at this point, is that it, they've said that a dashboard tour for Aaron Online would be really helpful to them. Um, and our teams are also busy making some improvements to that dashboard. So we're hoping to sync up all of those things and be able to put out a video to help people understand how to navigate and where to find what they need um, on when they're logged into their Aaron online account. And then for hybrid. So as you all know, this meeting spaced out across its, we keep saying it's four days, um, three weeks, two time zones. So it's it's a wild ride. But we're actually, the, the great thing about what we're doing with our member meeting in Minnesota is it's giving us a chance to test drive a hybrid meeting before we have to do it for a full po public policy and members meeting in the spring, which is what we're going to do. Um, we will have folks, you know, as long as everything um, 
permits for us to do it safely, we will have an on-site meeting in Nashville um, in April, but we will also be offering a full hybrid um, option for folks that are not comfortable or unable to travel at that point in time so that we can try to, um, to take remote participation to the next level and, and bring those folks into the meeting in a in an even more meaningful way. And as I mentioned, we're not sure yet um, for the fellowship whether we'll be bringing them with us in person or whether that will be, remain a completely virtual program, but stay tuned for news. We will be updating as decisions are made and as applications open and registration opens, all that information will be available early next year. And then the other item um, that I just, I didn't wanna skip over it because I had mentioned it at Aaron 47 and frankly, we haven't had time to make much progress on it is that we do still hope to launch a pro series um, of IPv6 webinars. And that would be us coordinating with folks in the community who want to come in and do, we would do hosting the training. They would be bringing the content and we're gonna be bringing them the audience. So as we move forward, with specking out that plan, you can be looking for news of that in the new year and hopefully we'll be finding folks that um, are interested in working with us on that. If you're interested or know someone who might be um, and wants to kind of get ahead of the eight, you can email us at training at Aaron.net and we're happy to um, take your information and, and as we start planning, pull you in to that conversation right up front. Next slide. All right, that was a speed drive through everything that's been happening in training and outreach since Aaron 47. Before I hand it off um, for open microphone, did were there any questions from the audience? Thanks Anybody? so much. I am looking, I'm not seeing any questions at the moment, but okay. I was trying to give everybody a minute to uh, see, but if they come in during open microphone, we can, uh, we can grab them then too. Thank you Absolutely. again for your presentation. Thank you. All right, at this time, I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Curran for our open microphone time. Okay, uh, thank you everyone for uh, uh, coming to this meeting. Uh, I think it's been wonderful. Um, I want to uh, take an opportunity now to do something that's a bit of a tradition at Aaron, which is our open microphone. We generally end each day with that. So uh, at this time, the microphones are open. Uh, I'm available. Our chair, Paul Anderson, is available. Uh, staff is standing by. If we have any questions, please raise your hand or put them in the Q&A. Thank you. Standing by on open mic. Mics are open. There will be open microphone tomorrow and also yeah. at our in-person and hybrid virtual meeting in Minneapolis. Many of us are looking forward to those that can make it, seeing you all. Last chance. We're just a quiet it's bunch been a long there. day with policy, but we're, we're here for you now. I'm gonna be closing the mic shortly. Okay, thank you everyone. Uh, we'll, again, we'll have an open microphone tomorrow. Uh, thank you for your participation in the meeting. I'll turn it back over to our moderators. And with that, we just wanna thank you. Uh, we want to thank our network sponsors, USI and Lumen. Next slide. And remind you that tomorrow at noon Eastern, uh, we will be ready for day two of Aaron, some more policy, but also our NRO reports, as well as a government affairs update. So with that, we'd like to thank everybody for attending today and hope we will see you again tomorrow. Have a great afternoon. <laughs>